Tame a Rake Duke The Harrington Sisters, Book One Written by Abby Ailes and published by Starfall Publications Available on our website and on Amazon. Enjoy! Chapter One Lady Rosalind's emerald eyes darted between her sisters. Their father's announcement still hung in the air like a gathering storm cloud. Amelia, the eldest daughter of the house and ever the picture of grace and composure, sat with her hands folded neatly in her lap. But Rosalind could see the tension in her fingers. Isabella, on the other hand, seemed to shrink into herself, her delicate features etched with worry as she nibbled on her lower lip. The silence in the drawing room was deafening, broken only by the ticking of the ornate clock on the mantelpiece. Rosalind's mind raced as she tried to make sense of her father's words. A courtship with the Duke of Somerton, Rosalind thought incredulously. It was unthinkable. The man was a notorious rake, known for his scandalous affairs and cold demeanour. Rosalind's admittedly fiery spirit bubbled to the surface, and she turned to face her father, her voice cutting through the heavy stillness. Father, how can you possibly consider this? The Duke is hardly a suitable match for any of us. His reputation precedes him, and I cannot fathom why you would want to subject one of your daughters to such a fate. Rosalind knew better as soon as she spoke. Lord Matthew Harrington, Baron of Highmoor, was not a man given to jesting. Lord Harrington's eyes narrowed. With steel in his voice, he replied, Rosalind, you will mind your tone. The Duke is a man of great influence and wealth, a peer of the realm. A match with him would secure our family's future. It is not your place to question my decisions. Rosalind bit back a retort, her cheeks flushing with indignation. She glanced at Amelia, hoping to find an ally in her sister's calm reasoning. But Amelia's gaze was fixed on the floor, her expression unreadable. Lady Amelia Harrington had long ago mastered the art of looking serene in the face of conflict and trial. It was a skill that eluded Rosalind, who constantly found herself being chided for making faces out loud. Isabella's soft voice broke the tension, barely above a whisper. Father, must one of us truly marry the Duke? Surely there must be another way. Her gentle voice trailed off into silence. Lord Matthew's features softened slightly as he regarded his youngest daughter. Though she was a young lady, she still held the position of baby of the family, and Lord Matthew was always a soft touch with her. Isabella, my dear, I understand your reservations, but this is a matter of great importance. The Duke has expressed his interest, and it is our duty to consider his proposal. He paused, an inscrutable look passing over his face. Our family is in a precarious situation. Rosalind's heart clenched as she watched Isabella's eyes fill with tears. She knew her sister's gentle spirit was ill-suited for the harsh realities of a loveless marriage, to say nothing of the pressures of marrying to save her sisters. Amelia, too, seemed to be struggling with the weight of their father's words. Even her normally placid expression was troubled. Rising from her seat, Rosalind took a deep breath and faced her father, her voice steady despite the turmoil within her. Father, I beg you to reconsider. We are not mere pawns to be traded for social standing. We deserve a chance at happiness, at a love that is true and pure. Despite her boldness, she was trembling within herself. It was against the natural order of her world to speak out so against one's father. Moreover, it was a radical idea she voiced, one completely out of sync with most of society. Lord Harrington's gaze hardened, his voice taking on a sharp edge. Rosalind, you forget yourself. It is not your place to dictate the future of this family. One of you will marry the Duke, and that is the end of it. I will hear no more of this rebellious talk, he said with finality. Rosalind's heart sank as her father's words echoed in the drawing room. She watched as Lord Harrington paced before them, his voice and face unyielding. The Duke's intention to choose one of you as his bride is an opportunity that should not be missed, he declared, 
his eyes sweeping over his daughters. This alliance could secure our family's future and elevate our standing in society. He paused again and fixed Rosalind with his grey-blue eyes. Would you really deny your sisters the chance at security? Rosalind exchanged a glance with Amelia, but her face was once again carefully blank. If Rosalind didn't know better, she would think that Amelia had placidly accepted her father's directive. Isabella, seated beside them, seemed to shrink further into herself, her delicate hands clasped tightly in her lap. Lord Harrington began to pace before the fireplace, his tone growing more insistent. I am well aware of the rumours that have been circulating about the Duke's morals, but I assure you they are nothing more than false and unfair accusations. His decision to find a duchess is a clear attempt to prove society wrong and demonstrate his commitment to his title and responsibilities. Rosalind felt a flicker of anger at her father's dismissal of the rumours. How could he be so willing to overlook the Duke's questionable reputation for the sake of social advancement, she wondered. Something about her father's insistence prickled in her brain, but she could not articulate why. Our family has had a long-standing alliance with the Dukes, Lord Matthew reminded them, lowering his voice slightly. I have known him since he was a boy, and I trust in his character. He is a man of honour and integrity, despite what some may say. It's nothing more than petty jealousy, the usual sickness of the ton. Rosalind wanted to protest to argue that if the Duke's past actions spoke louder than any assurances of his character, then where did the speculation about him come from? She bit her words back, knowing that her father would not take kindly to further opposition. She clamped her teeth together tightly to keep herself from arguing. Lord Harrington's gaze swept over his daughters once more, his expression growing stern. I must admonish you girls for your romantic notions. The idea of love and fairy tale scenarios has no place in the reality of our world. You should feel honoured by the Duke's interest and recognise the opportunity that has been presented to you. Rosalind's heart clenched at her father's words. She knew well enough that one of the watchwords for a young lady was supposed to be duty. But that particular lesson paled for Rosalind in the face of notions of love and friendship. I expect you all to put aside your childish fantasies and approach this matter with the gravity it deserves, Lord Harrington concluded, his tone leaving no room for argument. Rosalind's mind raced, considering the implications of the Duke's impending arrival and the potential impact on her life and future. Father, surely you cannot expect us to make such a life-altering decision so quickly. How much time do we have to prepare ourselves? she asked carefully. Lord Harrington sighed, reaching up to pinch the bridge of his nose with thumb and forefinger. There is no time for deliberation, Rosalind. The Duke of Somerton, Alexander Fitzwilliam, is paying us the compliment of a visit this afternoon. You and your sisters must be prepared to receive him and make a favourable impression. The room fell silent again. Lord Harrington may as well have dropped a mortar shell in their midst for all the impact his words had. Rosalind exchanged glances with her sisters, seeing the disbelief and apprehension etched on their faces. The urgency of the situation heightened the tension, and Rosalind felt her heart pounding in her chest. This afternoon, father, Amelia repeated, her tone a little disbelieving. That's hardly enough warning to prepare a proper reception. Have the servants been warned? And we must have time to ready ourselves as well. We've not had a hairdresser call on us for weeks. And... She continued in this manner, fretting about the duties of a hostess. Rosalind's own worries drowned out her older sister's concerns. Her mind raced, considering the implications of the Duke's impending arrival. What kind of man is he truly? Could the rumours of his scandalous behaviour be trusted, or were they merely the product of idle gossip? What sort of life could one hope to build with such a man, should the rumours prove true? Angry but refusing to provoke her father further, she turned her head away sharply, her gaze fixing on the front windows of the parlour they were gathered in. The cheery yellow walls seemed a cruelly ironic contrast to their dark moods. Chapter 2 
As the Duke's gilded and crested carriage pulled to a stop before the Harrington's fashionable townhouse, Rosalind felt a knot of apprehension tighten in her stomach. She glanced at her sisters. Amelia, ever the picture of poise, stood tall and regal, her golden curls perfectly framing her face. Isabella, on the other hand, seemed to be doing her level best to simply disappear into the ground, her eyes fixed on her feet. All three sisters had been carefully coiffed, powdered, and dressed in the most flattering day dresses they owned. The high waists of their muslin and printed cotton dresses were accentuated with ribbons in colours that flattered their complexions. Purple for Rosalind, delicate pink for Amelia, and cornflower blue for Isabella. The three sisters and their father were assembled on the tiny patch of grass on one side of the short path from the street to the townhouse's front door. Opposite them, the servants were likewise assembled, standing in a neat line to greet the Duke, aprons and collars stiffly starched. To see them, no one would ever guess that despite their serene appearances, the house had been in a chaotic furore over last-minute preparations. Secretly, Rosalind suspected that her father would likely get an earful from the housekeeper on the subject. A footman hustled forward and opened the carriage door, the Duke's crest gleaming in the sun as he did so. Everyone assembled seemed to collectively hold their breath as the Duke emerged, one hand steadying his dove-grey top hat. Rosalind's breath caught in her throat as she took in his imposing figure, his dark hair and piercing eyes giving him an air of authority and power. He moved with a confident grace, his exquisitely tailored marine blue jacket accentuating his broad shoulders and lean frame. Lord Harrington stepped forward, a broad smile on his face as he greeted the Duke. Your Grace, welcome to Harrington Manor. It is an honour to have you here. The assembled crowd all bowed and curtsied in unison as the Duke descended the carriage steps and accepted Lord Harrington's proffered hand. The Duke inclined his head, his gaze sweeping over the assembled family. Thank you for your hospitality, Lord Harrington. I have heard so much about the charms of your daughters that I am delighted to finally meet them. Rosalind felt a flicker of annoyance. Though the Duke's words were polite enough, there was a twist of irony in his tone that set her teeth on edge. Rosalind was quite sure that she and her sisters were more than mere objects to be admired and appraised. Though a little untoward for a lady to do so, she met his gaze defiantly, determined not to be cowed by his presence or the expectations placed upon her. There was something of a challenge on her face, fairly daring the Duke to note her. Lord Harrington began the formal introductions, starting with Amelia. Your Grace, may I present my eldest daughter, Lady Amelia Harrington. She is a young lady of many accomplishments, an ornament wherever she goes. Rosalind scoffed inwardly, unable to completely resist rolling her eyes. Why didn't Father simply erect an auction stage and be done with it, she thought snidely. Amelia, however, curtsied deeply, her movements fluid and practised. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Your Grace, she said, her voice soft and demure. Welcome to Harrington House. The Duke took Amelia's fingers, bowing over them so closely that Rosalind thought for a moment that he would drop a kiss on them. The pleasure is all mine, Lady Amelia. I have heard much about your beauty and accomplishments from many green-eyed ladies of the ton. Amelia blushed accordingly and demurred again, exactly as was expected of her. The Duke, for his part, seemed bemused and pleased by the response. Rosalind watched the exchange, her stomach churning with unease. She knew that Amelia was the most likely choice to become the Duchess, given her impeccable manners and poised demeanour, but the thought of her sister being trapped in a marriage with a man of questionable intent, no matter what her father said, made Rosalind chafe. Rosalind found herself studying the Duke, trying to discern the man beneath the polished exterior. There was an air of arrogance about him, a sense of entitlement that set her teeth on edge. She wondered what kind of husband he would make, and whether he would treat his wife with the respect and kindness she deserved. Despite her reservations, Rosalind knew that she had to play her part in this charade. She curtsied gracefully when her turn came, 
meeting the Duke's gaze with a cool politeness. Your Grace, she said, her voice steady despite the turmoil raging within her. The Duke's eyes lingered on her for a moment, a flicker of recognition sparking in their depths. Lady Rosalind, he replied coolly, I have heard much about your wit and spirit. I look forward to becoming better acquainted. Rosalind felt a shiver run down her spine at his words, unsure whether to be flattered or unnerved by his attention. She knew that the coming days would be a test of her resolve as she navigated the treacherous waters of courtship and societal expectations, to say nothing of her father's expectation. For now all she could do was smile and nod, playing the role of the dutiful daughter, her face not feeling like her own as she kept a cheery expression plastered on. The Duke was ushered into the drawing room where tea was waiting, Amelia playing the part of consummate hostess. As they filed into the house, Rosalind managed to catch her sister's eyes in turn and found that though outwardly determined or serene, there was an undeniable tension in their bearing. Rosalind trailed along after Amelia and the Duke, her heart still pounding from the initial introduction. As they traversed the corridors of Harrington House, the Duke's attention was drawn to the paintings adorning the walls. His eyes widened with appreciation as he took in the intricate brushstrokes and vibrant colours. These paintings are exquisite, the Duke remarked, his gaze lingering on a particularly striking landscape. The subject was simple enough, a humble watermill on a brackish pond, but the sky above was a riot of colours alive with wind and clouds. Who is the artist behind these masterpieces? Rosalind seized the opportunity to speak up, her voice filled with pride. They are the creations of my younger sister, Isabella. She has an incredible talent for capturing the beauty of the world around us. The Duke turned to Isabella, who blushed under his scrutiny. And in oils, no less. I thought young ladies were confined to dabbling in watercolours. Rosalind opened her mouth, ready to argue with him, but Amelia put a hand on her arm, silencing her. You have a remarkable gift, Lady Isabella. Your paintings are truly breathtaking, the Duke said with a degree of sincerity that he had hitherto not shown. Isabella mumbled a quiet thank you, her eyes downcast as she shied away from the attention. Rosalind felt a pang of protectiveness for her younger sister, knowing how uncomfortable she was in the spotlight. Amelia, clearly recognising Isabella's discomfort as well, gently encouraged everyone into the drawing room where tea was laid out. An assortment of cakes and dainty little sandwiches were arranged on trays, which were ferried about the room by a pair of footmen. When the sisters were all settled with teacups in hand, the Duke cast a cool, appraising eye over them, settling on Rosalind. I don't recall seeing you at many social events this season, Lady Rosalind, he commented his tone casual, but his eyes challenging. Rosalind met his gaze, her green eyes sparkling with a mix of defiance and curiosity. I find my time is better used on other pursuits, she replied evenly. The Duke raised an eyebrow, intrigued by her response. And what pursuits might those be, Lady Rosalind? Rosalind hesitated for a moment, weighing her words carefully. She knew that her opinions were not always in line with the expectations of society, but she refused to hide her true self. If the Duke wished to make a match, then it was only fair that he knew her character precisely. I am fascinated by the ideas of progress and change, Your Grace. I believe that women have the potential to contribute so much more to society than what is currently expected of us. She paused, fixing her gaze on the sugar bowl, which the Duke was reaching for. I've recently been taken with the debate on the morality of sugar, for instance. Sugar? The Duke repeated, his hand hesitating. Sugar, Rosalind confirmed. There are some who find it to be a great evil, being the product of slave labour, a sign of the worst sort of decadence. She sipped her tea, her eyes finding the Duke's over the rim of her cup. Rosalind, Lord Harrington said into the silence that followed, his voice a warning. The Duke archered a brow aristocratically, amused by her bold statement. Deliberately, while maintaining direct eye contact with Rosalind, he 
He dumped another spoonful of sugar into his teacup and stirred it slowly, and the sound of the spoon on china made Rosalind grit her teeth. That is a rather unconventional view, Lady Rosalind. Do you not believe that concerning yourself with such things is detrimental to a woman's role to be a dutiful wife and mother? Rosalind felt a flare of anger at his words, but she kept her voice steady. I believe that a woman's role should be whatever she chooses it to be, Your Grace. We are capable of so much more than simply being decorative objects or bearers of children. The Duke studied her for a moment, his expression unreadable. And what do you believe is the true nature of happiness and fulfilment, Lady Rosalind? Rosalind met his gaze unflinchingly, her voice filled with conviction. I believe that happiness and fulfilment come from living a life true to oneself, Your Grace, from pursuing one's passions and making a difference in the world, regardless of the expectations placed upon us by society. The Duke's lips twitched into a small smile, his eyes glinting with a mix of amusement and admiration. You are a devotee of Mary Wollstonecraft, then, Lady Rosalyn. You know her work? Rosalind asked, unable to keep the surprise from her voice. She leaned forward, interested despite herself. The Duke offered a one-shouldered shrug, all casual composure. I've read her pamphlets. I must admit, I find your perspective rather refreshing, he said with another bemused tilt to the corners of his mouth. Rosalind felt a flutter of satisfaction at his words but she knew that her outspokenness could also be seen as a liability in the eyes of a potential suitor. She glanced at her father, who was watching the exchange with an expression caught between disbelief and apprehension. He cleared his throat pointedly, and Rosalind sullenly sat back again. The weather has been abnormally fine lately, Amelia blurted into the awkward silence that followed. The Duke's gaze, which had still been fixed on Rosalind, slid reluctantly to Amelia. It has, he agreed flatly. Rosalind resisted the urge to roll her eyes at the banality of the types of conversation that were considered suitable for young ladies to engage in. She withdrew into herself, becoming a spectator rather than a participant, exactly as was expected of her. The grand clock in the hall chimed four times, announcing the hour. The Duke stood preparing to take his leave. He bowed slightly to Lord Matthew. Thank you for your hospitality, Lord Harrington. It has been an... He paused, searching for the correct word. His eyes flicked to Rosalind. An illuminating afternoon. Your daughters are a credit to you. Lord Harrington beamed with pride, his chest puffing out slightly at the compliment. You are most welcome, Your Grace. It has been an honour to have you here. The Duke's gaze swept over the three sisters as they rose to curtsy and murmur their own polite farewells, lingering on each of them in turn. Ladies, it has been a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I must say, I am thoroughly impressed by your wit, intelligence and beauty. Rosalind felt a flicker of unease at his words, unsure whether to be flattered or wary of his attention, unsure of his sincerity. She watched as he took Amelia's fingers squeezing them gently. Lady Amelia, you are a most congenial hostess. You would make a fine wife to a lucky man indeed. Amelia blushed, her eyes downcast as she murmured a quiet thank you. Rosalind's heart clenched at the sight, knowing that her sister's fate hung in the balance. She hated everything about it, knowing that this man had the power to choose her sister's fate. The Duke turned to Isabella next and Rosalind tensed up further, worried that he might upset her in some way. To her surprise, his voice softened with admiration. Lady Isabella, your artistic talents are truly exceptional. I confess I've never seen their like, and I have no doubt that you will be appreciated for them. Isabella's cheeks flushed with pleasure at the praise, but Rosalind could see the underlying tension in her shoulders. She knew that her younger sister dreaded the thought of being thrust into the spotlight, of being the centre of attention that being such a high-ranking nobleman's wife would entail. Finally, the Duke's eyes settled on Rosalind, his gaze intense and searching. Lady Rosalind, 
your wit and intelligence are as bracingly refreshing as a cold breeze in winter. I have never met a woman quite like you before. Rosalind met his gaze steadily, refusing to be cowed by his words. I am honoured by your praise, your grace, but I must confess I am not one to be easily swayed by flattery. From the corner of her eye she could see her father give a hapless flap of his hands in frustration. The duke's lips twitched into a small smile, his eyes glinting with amusement. I would expect nothing less from you, Lady Rosalind. With that, the Duke exited the drawing-room with Lord Harrington, promising to call again soon. When the Duke left, the tension seemed to leak from the room. Exhaling through her mouth, Rosalind flopped in a most unladylike manner onto the upholstered settee. She turned to Isabella, and seeing the mix of fear and uncertainty in her eyes, grabbed her hand and encouraged her to sit next to her. What do you think will happen now? Isabella whispered her voice trembling slightly. Amelia shook her head, her face oddly pale and wan. She too sat on the settee, wedged between Isabella and the arm, but perched right on the edge as if she would bolt up at a moment's notice. I don't know, Isabella, but we must be prepared for whatever comes our way. Rosalind tilted her head at Amelia, something in her oldest sister's manner bothering her. Her mind raced. She knew that the Duke's decision would have far-reaching consequences that would affect all of them. Rosalind couldn't shake the feeling that their lives were about to change forever. She glanced out the window, catching a glimpse of the small garden behind the house, watching as the sun began to set behind the other London houses, casting a warm glow over the carefully maintained hedges. Chapter 3 Rosalind wandered through the lush gardens of Harrington House, her mind heavy with the weight of the Duke's attentions. After his initial visit, he had called on them a number of times, even escorting them about Regent's Park. The fragrant blooms and gentle rustling of leaves did little to soothe her troubled thoughts as she sought solace in the tranquil and familiar gardens of her home. Absently, she reached out and plucked a flower from one of the hedges tearing the petals from it as she walked, leaving them scattered in her wake. As she rounded a bend in the path, Rosalind spotted her sisters, Amelia and Isabella, seated on a stone bench beneath a towering oak tree nestled in a corner of the garden. Their faces mirrored the same concern and uncertainty that plagued Rosalind's heart. Amelia, Isabella, Rosalind called out, her voice carrying across the garden. I'm glad I found you both. Amelia looked up, her golden curls catching the sunlight as she offered a weak smile. Rosalind, we were just discussing the Duke. It's all so overwhelming, isn't it? The idea that one of us could be a duchess so soon, married and settled, she said, her voice cracking a little at the end. Rosalind's brow furrowed in concern, but she nodded, taking a seat beside her sisters. It is. I can't help but question his intentions, and the thought of being forced into a marriage of convenience fills me with dread. Isabella's blue eyes widened, her voice barely above a whisper. I don't want to lose my freedom to paint, Rosalind. The idea of having to abandon my art for the sake of husband and duty. It's all too much. She twisted her hands into the skirt of her calico daydress as she spoke her knuckles going white. Rosalind reached out, gently taking Isabella's hand in her own. I know, Isabella. It's not fair that we're expected to sacrifice our happiness for the sake of societal expectations. Amelia sighed, her eyes distant and sad. It's not as if we have much choice, Rosalind. Besides, Father has made it clear that this is an opportunity we cannot refuse and he's not wrong. We must marry, and marry well, since, since our brother... Amelia stopped short, swallowing hard. There's no one to look after us once father is gone. We need safety and protection, which the Duke can provide, she said. But it was clear that she was trying to convince herself as well. Rosalind shook her head, her fiery curls bouncing with the motion, refusing to accept Amelia's words. 
We should have a choice, Amelia. We should be able to decide our own futures, to marry for love and companionship, not just for the sake of advantageous alliances. But the Duke is a powerful man, Rosalind, Amelia countered, her voice tinged with resignation. To refuse his proposal could bring shame and scandal upon our family. Rosalind stood abruptly, pacing the garden path as her frustration mounted. And what of our own desires, Amelia? Are we to be nothing more than pawns in this game of politics and power? Isabella's soft voice broke through the tension. I don't want to be a pawn, Rosalind, but I also don't want to bring ruin upon our family. How would we live? Rosalind turned to face her sisters, her green eyes blazing with determination. There must be another way, a way to navigate this situation without sacrificing our own happiness and dreams. Amelia's delicate brow furrowed in thought. But what can we do, Rosalind? We're bound by the expectations of our society, by the rules that govern our lives as women. We've no experience of the world. What do you want us to do, take in washing? she asked rhetorically. The only one of us who has a chance in that regard is Isabella. And even then, how many women are able to live by the brush? Isabella's eyes darted back and forth between the sisters, her eyes wide with alarm. Rosalind's shoulders slumped, the weight of their predicament bearing down upon her. I don't know, Amelia, but I refuse to accept that we have no say in our own futures. As the three sisters sat in the garden, the sun began to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows over the garden as it sank behind the London skyline. The sounds from the streets beyond the walled sanctuary of the garden began to fade with the light. The serenity of the moment stood in stark contrast to the turmoil that raged within their hearts. Rosalind, I know this is difficult, but we must think of our family's future, Amelia said softly, her golden curls giving her an angelic aspect as she spoke. An advantageous match with the Duke could secure our position in society and ensure our continued prosperity. Whichever of us he marries will be able to support the others and in time find advantageous matches for them as well. Rosalind sighed, unable to argue with the truth of her sister's words. She knew Amelia was right, that their duty as daughters of a noble house was to make strategic alliances and uphold the family name. It still seemed too much to ask of them when they had been raised in a house with so much love to forego it once they were married. You don't think we're worthy of love? She demanded, staring straight into Amelia's eyes. Isabella, who had been sitting quietly beside them, suddenly spoke up, her voice tinged with melancholy. Love is nothing more than a dream, a fleeting illusion that only brings pain and disappointment. Rosalind and Amelia's expressions quickly shifted to ones of surprise and worry, taken aback by the sadness and pessimism in their youngest sister's words. Isabella had always been the most vibrant and creative of the three, her spirit filled with joy and wonder. To hear her speak so despondently was a stark contrast to her usual demeanour. Isabella, what makes you say that? Rosalind asked gently resuming her seat and reaching out to take her sister's hand in her own. She glanced over Isabella's downturned head to Amelia again. Has something happened to make you feel this way? She pried, trying to be delicate, but Isabella shrank in on herself further. Isabella's eyes filled with tears, her lower lip trembling as she shook her head. Please, I don't want to talk about it. It's too painful. Amelia leaned in, her voice soft and soothing. Is this about your young beau, Isabella? Isabella's shoulders trembled as she fought back a sob, her hands clenched tightly in her lap. I can't. I don't want to discuss it. Please, let's not speak of it any more, she said with a vehement shake of her head. Rosalind and Amelia exchanged another worried glance. Rosalind could see the same concern and tender feeling for their youngest sister on Amelia's face that was in her own heart. Rosalind knew from experience that pushing Isabella to open up would only cause her more distress, so she respected her wishes and changed the subject tactfully. What about your dreams for the future, Amelia? Rosalind asked, hoping to steer the conversation in a more positive direction. 
I know you've always had a passion for helping others, for making a difference in the world. Amelia smiled softly. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Her eyes distant as she contemplated Rosalind's question. I've always dreamed of establishing a charity, of using our family's resources to help those less fortunate. I suppose that should I marry the Duke, I would be well placed to do that now. Rosalind smiled a little sadly. Amelia had always been the most kind-hearted of the three, so it was no surprise that she was already imagining how to turn her prospective new position into a force for good. The unspoken truth in Amelia's words was that this would all be subject to the whims of her husband. Amelia was good and dutiful, but Rosalind didn't doubt that even she would begin to chafe under the yoke of duty. And what of you, Rosalind? Amelia asked, turning her attention to her fiery-haired sister. Have you any hope for the future? With a sigh, her words coming slowly at first, as if the idea were forming as she was saying it, she replied, I want to be free, Amelia, free to make my own choices, to follow my own path. But I fear that freedom may be nothing more than a distant dream, a luxury we cannot afford as daughters of the ton. Chapter 4 Rosalind's mind wandered to the countless sacrifices her own mother had made, the compromises she had endured for the sake of her family's standing. Lady Harrington had been a bright and vibrant beauty in her youth, but that vivacity had faded with each passing year. She remembered the sadness that had often lingered in her mother's eyes, the wistful sighs that had escaped her lips when she thought no one was watching. Rosalind had never known what her mother had wanted of life. By the time she was old enough to ask such a thing, Lady Harrington was deep in the throes of the fever that would eventually claim her life. Is this to be my fate as well? To live a life of quiet desperation, forever bound by the chains of duty and obligation? Rosalind wondered bitterly, her eyes fixed on the garden gate without really seeing it. Some part of her longed to stand up and run out the gate, out into the London street beyond, to try and live what life she could by herself, for herself. As these thoughts swirled through her mind, Rosalind felt a gentle hand on her shoulder. She started a little and looked up to see Amelia and Isabella watching her with concern. Rosalind, I know this is difficult, Amelia said softly, her voice filled with compassion. But we're here for each other no matter what happens. None of us has to do this on her own. Isabella nodded, her own eyes glistening with unshed tears. We'll face this together, Rosalind. As sisters, united in our love and support for one another. Rosalind felt a wave of emotion wash over her, the love and solidarity of her sisters filling her with a sense of strength and determination. She knew that the road ahead would be difficult, that there would be challenges and sacrifices to be made. But with Amelia and Isabella by her side, she felt a glimmer of hope that they could weather any storm, that they could find a way to navigate the treacherous waters of society and emerge stronger and more united than ever before. As the three sisters sat in the garden, Rosalind laid her hand on Isabella's and squeezed it. Amelia, in turn, placed her hand over top theirs, and all of their fingers wove together in solidarity. Whatever the future held, whatever compromises they might be forced to make, they would face it together, drawing strength from their unbreakable bond and their unwavering love for one another. The sound of the gong rang out from the house, announcing that it was time to dress for dinner and bringing them all back to reality sharply. Amelia withdrew her hand, standing suddenly. Rosalind. Her eyebrows raised in surprise, looked up at Amelia. We've been too long in the garden, Amelia said flatly, her face a careful mask of blankness. It's time we go in. Though she spoke simply and truly, there was a weight to her words, as if she weren't simply discussing their need to prepare for dinner. There was a grim set to her mouth, all trace of the gentle hope that had been there just moments before gone. 
Rosalind's brow furrowed with concern as she watched Amelia's face, searching for any clue as to what had caused this sudden shift in mood. She reached out, gently placing a hand on her sister's arm. Amelia, what's wrong? Amelia didn't respond. Instead, she abruptly pulled away from Rosalind's touch, her arm sliding from Rosalind's hand. She turned and fled into the house, the light sprigged cotton robing of her dress fluttering behind her as she did so. Her hurried footsteps echoed on the stone path, growing fainter as she disappeared into the house. Rosalind exchanged a worried glance with Isabella, who had been quietly observing the exchange. Without a word, the two sisters set off in pursuit of Amelia, crashing through the fashionable French doors at the back of the house, in a manner that would have made a number of society matrons purse their lips in disapproval. Rosalind caught a glimpse of Amelia's light pink silk shoes and airy cotton dress disappearing up the stairs to her apartments. She quickened her steps, grabbing the banister and swinging herself up onto the stairs as if she were a boy. Her heart pounded in her ears as she followed the sound of her sister's footsteps up the grand staircase and down the hallway that led to all of their rooms. Isabella kept pace with Rosalind, her blue eyes round and worried. What do you think happened? she whispered, her voice barely audible over the soft thud of their slippers on the plush rug that lined the hallway. Rosalind shook her head, her brow creased with worry. I don't know, but we need to find out. Amelia's not one to run off like this. As they approached Amelia's door, Rosalind raised her hand to knock, but hesitated. She could hear the muffled sound of sobbing from within, and her heart squeezed at the thought of her sister in such distress. Without preamble, Rosalind entered Amelia's bedchamber. The sight that greeted her made her stop short. Amelia, careful and quiet, sat on her bed her usually pristine appearance marred by the tears that streamed down her face. In her trembling hands she clutched a letter, the paper crumpling under the force of her grip. Rosalind approached her sister with gentle steps, the slow creaking of the wooden floor the only sound other than Amelia's quiet sobs. She sat down beside Amelia, the mattress dipping under her weight, and placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. The warmth of her touch seemed to break through Amelia's anguish, and she leaned into Rosalind's embrace, her body shaking with silent sobs. Isabella followed close behind, her own mien one of concern. She stood before them for a moment, wringing her hands with worry, unsure what to do before finding a chair. She took a seat nearby, her hands folded in her lap as she watched her sisters with wide, troubled eyes. Amelia, my dear, Rosalind murmured her voice tender and soothing as she stroked Amelia's back gently. What troubles you so? This is most unlike you. Let us help. Amelia drew in a shuddering breath, her grip on the letter loosening slightly. She turned to face Rosalind, her eyes red-rimmed and puffy from crying. It's... it's this letter, she whispered, her voice hoarse with emotion. From... from him... Rosalind watched as Amelia's hands trembled, the letter she held fluttering like a trapped bird. Her sister's voice quivered, each word a struggle against the tide of emotion that threatened to overwhelm her. I... I have been keeping a secret from you both, Amelia began, her eyes fixed on the crumpled paper in her grasp. A secret that I have carried in my heart for months now. Rosalind drew back a little holding Amelia at arm's length. She'd never have guessed that Amelia harboured some secret in her heart. Amelia had ever been the perfect daughter, the one to which all other girls of the town aspired to be like. More importantly, she had never seen Amelia so distraught, so consumed by a pain that seemed to radiate from her very soul. Rosalind searched Amelia's face for meaning. It's... there's a... a young man... Amelia whispered, her voice barely audible over the hitch in her breath. A... a soldier I have been corresponding with. Amelia, Rosalind breathed, half in shock and half in admiration. You've been writing to a man. It's not like that, Amelia sniffed, dabbing at her nose with a handkerchief she fished out of her pocket. 
I met his sister first. She was involved with helping me to set up that new school in Manchester. You know, the one for the factory workers. Her brother was there that day, and then... We would go for walks and talk, the three of us, and then he had to go back to the front, she said, her eyes filling with fresh tears. She writes to me and encloses Thomas's letters to me in her own for the look of it. Does father know? Isabella asked, her voice low in case they were overheard. Amelia gave Isabella a baleful look that answered that question. I'd always hoped he'd made promises, you see, and... And now? Rosalind's eyes widened, a flicker of understanding dawning in their emerald depths. She had always noted that Amelia was always eager for the arrival of the postbag, but had never suspected she had a secret suitor. I love him, Amelia confessed, the words tumbling from her lips like a dam had burst. With all my heart, with every fibre of my being, we have shared our dreams, our hopes for a future together after the war. Tears spilled down Amelia's cheeks, leaving glistening trails in their wake. Rosalind reached out, her hand finding her sister's and squeezing gently, a silent offer of support and understanding. But now? Amelia's voice broke, a sob tearing from her throat. Now, with the Duke's proposal, with the prospect of being chosen as his bride, I fear that all those dreams will be shattered. Rosalind's heart ached for her sister, for the pain that seemed to consume her. She glanced at Isabella, saw the same sorrow on her younger sister's face. Oh, Amelia. Rosalind murmured, her own voice thick with emotion. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Amelia nodded, her grip on the letter tightening. This, this is his latest letter, she whispered, her fingers tracing the words as if they were a lifeline. He writes of the battles he has fought, the sacrifices he has made, but always, always he speaks of his love for me, of the life we will build together. Rosalind felt a lump form in her throat, a knot of emotion that threatened to choke her. She herself didn't know the power of love, but she had seen the way it could consume and transform, the way it could make even the darkest of days seem bright. A small secret part of her had always longed for a love like that, but it seemed such a triviality in the face of her larger concerns. Isabella scooted the chair closer, her small hand resting on Amelia's knee. We are here for you, sister, she said softly, her voice filled with a gravitas beyond her years that made both sisters stare at her. No matter what happens, no matter what the future may hold, we will stand by your side. Amelia's lips trembled, a watery smile breaking through the tears. Thank you, she whispered, her gaze moving from one sister to the other. I don't know what I would do without you both. As Rosalind listened to Amelia's heartfelt confession, a wave of emotion washed over her. There was no doubting the depth of her sister's love for Thomas. It was palpable in every word, every tear that fell from her eyes. It had to be serious by virtue of the fact that Amelia had kept it a secret for so long. Rosalind's heart ached for Amelia for the injustice of a world that would seek to tear apart two hearts so deeply entwined. A fierce protectiveness surged through Rosalind, a determination to shield her sister from the cruel machinations of society. She knew all too well the weight of expectation, the suffocating pressure to conform to the roles and duties prescribed by their station. But in that moment, as she sat there with Amelia and Isabella, their hearts laid bare, Rosalind felt a resolve growing within her. She would not let Amelia's dreams be shattered, would not let her sister's chance at true happiness be sacrificed on the altar of duty and obligation. Even if it meant making a difficult choice, even if it meant putting her own desires aside, Rosalind knew that she would do whatever it took to protect Amelia's love. They both had far, far more to lose than she, and she would not see them throw away their chances at happiness. She'd always been too strong, too indomitable. This is what she'd been given such robustness, such spirit for, to weather what they could not. 
Amelia, Rosalind said softly, her voice filled with a quiet strength. I cannot begin to imagine the pain you must be feeling, the fear of losing something so precious. But know this, we will find a way. We will fight for your happiness, for the future you and Thomas have dreamed of together. Amelia's eyes met Rosalind's, a flicker of hope amidst the despair. But how? she whispered, her voice hoarse with emotion. How can we possibly stand against the Duke, against the expectations of our father in society? Rosalind's lips curved into a small, determined smile. We will find a way, she repeated, her words a promise, a vow. Together we are stronger than any force that would seek to tear us apart. I will not rest until you and Thomas can be together, until your love can flourish freely, without fear or constraint. Isabella nodded, her own eyes shining with a fierce loyalty. We are with you, Amelia, she said, her hand squeezing her sister's knee. Always and forever, we will weather this storm together, as we always have. After a tense dinner, in which the three sisters sullenly pushed food about their plates and their father mostly sighed, they decided to forego the usual after-dinner socialising in the parlour. Everyone retreated to their respective rooms and the house fell silent, save for the occasional sound of a servant still moving about. Unbeknownst to them, Rosalind remained awake, her mind racing with the next steps she would need to take. She knew that time was of the essence, that she would need to act quickly and decisively if she were to secure her sister's happiness. With a determined set to her jaw, Rosalind rose from her bed, her heart pounding with a mixture of fear and anticipation. Relying only on the silvery moonlight that filtered in through the window, Rosalind made her way to her dressing room. Quickly she slipped back into her stays and donned a redingote with some difficulty, as she didn't want to ring for her maid to help her. With sharp, careless movements she coiled her braid up at the back of her head and jammed pins into it. Cautiously she cracked open the door to her bedchamber and peered out ensuring the hallway was abandoned and slipped out. She moved silently through the darkened halls of the manor, her footsteps muffled by the plush carpets beneath her feet. Carrying her boots in one hand so that her steps would be lighter, Rosalind glided down the stairs and through the ground floor of the house. She paused at the entrance to the servants' area downstairs, ears straining as she listened. From below, the sounds of kitchen maids and hall boys still at work filtered up. Careful now, she thought to herself. With the greatest care possible, she put her foot on the first stair, which felt obliged to let out a great squeak that sounded as loud as a gunshot in the silent house. Rosalind grimaced, willing everyone to stay abed. She could not afford to get caught now. The moment passed, and Rosalind quickly rushed down the stairs, lifting one of the maid's cloaks from a hook by the back door as she went. She paused long enough outside to slip her boots on and drew the hood up over her distinctive hair. Her heart pounded with a mixture of fear and determination. The cool night air caressed her face, sending a shiver down her spine as she made her way to the stables. Her footsteps clicked quietly on the paving stones of the mews as she scurried along. The moon cast a soft glow over the grounds, illuminating her path as she moved with purpose and resolve. Upon reaching the stables, Rosalind quickly located her favourite horse, a beautiful mare with a sleek, dark coat. With swift, practised movements, she saddled the horse, her hands trembling slightly as she tightened the girth and adjusted the stirrups. The familiar scent of hay and horse filled her nostrils, a comforting reminder of the countless hours she had spent riding, the one place she might find solace and freedom. Uncharacteristically for a young lady, she was a dab hand at saddling her own horse, refusing to have this practical skill denied to her. Once the horse was tacked, Rosalind tried to heave at the stable door, but it was stuck firm. She grunted and tried again, but to no avail. Move! Blast you! she said through gritted teeth, pulling at it again. I thought ladies didn't know how to curse, a voice said from behind her. Rosalind nearly jumped clean out of her boots, whipping around to find Joe, one of the grooms, watching her. You gave me such a start, she said, holding a hand to her pounding heart. Here, 
Help me with this, she said, jerking her head toward the door. Joe hesitated, shifting nervously from one foot to the other. I don't know, milady. It, it seems wrong, he said. Rosalind sighed. I do not have time for this, she thought. You've never objected to helping me sneak out before, she pointed out. No, milady, but that weren't in the middle of the night, he argued, which was too sensible for Rosalind to argue with. Fine, Rosalind said. I'll give you two shillings this time. Right away, milady. Joe hurried forward and leaned against the door, which immediately slid open. Rosalind gave him a baleful look as she passed by, which he smiled at cheerfully. As she prepared to mount her horse, Rosalind paused for a moment, casting a final glance back at the house. The imposing structure loomed behind her, its windows dark and silent, a testament to the slumbering inhabitants within. Her heart ached at the thought of leaving her sisters behind, of the worry and concern they would undoubtedly feel upon discovering her absence. But she knew that this was a journey she had to undertake alone, a sacrifice she was willing to make for their happiness and well-being. With a deep breath, Rosalind swung herself into the saddle, settling her leg carefully into place on the side saddle. She gathered the reins in her hands, feeling the supple leather between her fingers, a tangible connection to the powerful animal that would carry her forward. With a gentle squeeze of her legs and a soft click of her tongue, Rosalind urged her horse into motion, the sound of hoofbeats echoing through the night air as they set off into the unknown. As the house receded behind her, Rosalind's mind raced with thoughts of the challenges that lay ahead. She knew that her journey would be fraught with obstacles, that she would face opposition and resistance at every turn, but she was armed with her wit, her courage, and the unwavering love and support of her sisters, a force that would sustain her through even the darkest of times. She refused to be afraid. The cool night breeze whipped past her as she rode, threatening to dislodge the hood from her head. It was imperative that she not be spotted out at night, unchaperoned, so she urged the horse into a spirited canter. Still, the steady rhythm of her horse's gait was a comforting constant amidst the swirling emotions within her heart. Rosalind's eyes remained fixed firmly ahead, her gaze unwavering as she pressed onward, determined to see her mission through to the end. Chapter 5 The Duke of Somerton could feel a tremendous, irrepressible sigh building within him. Thankfully, he was in the privacy of his own carriage, and thus not able to be overheard. He'd kept his composure as he had spent another evening in the company of the Harrington sisters, but only just. He didn't object to them per se, but the situation he found himself in chafed at him. The Tun were a petty, gossipy lot as far as he was concerned, but a necessary evil to move through society. Unfortunately, the gossip had turned towards himself once again, a resurrection of the trouble he had thought to put behind him. The carriage, well padded and richly upholstered in velvet and brocade, was comfortingly insulated against the sounds and smells of London. Here, in private, was one of the few locations in which Alex felt secure being completely and totally himself. It was exhausting having to constantly watch one's facial expressions and minutest gestures, lest they be misinterpreted in some way. Even so, the thick traffic that always sprang up around Vauxhall Gardens did nothing to improve his mood. The carriages, traps, barouches and landaus all crept along at a snail's pace, horses and vehicles all jammed together. Handkerchiefs were waved from windows in order to catch the attention of others. Fans fluttered flirtatiously before faces when eyes met. It was all a bit much. The Duke was gazing out of the carriage window without really seeing the scenery as it passed by. A flash of colour caught his eye. A familiar tope. At the same moment, an unmistakable voice hit his ears. It was loud, singing boisterously. The Duke bolted upright, at last, able to see part of what was causing such a logjam. There, on a bench just outside the entrance to Vauxhall, sat the Duke's brother. Viscount Richard Harrington. Richard was sprawled in a most undignified manner, long legs splayed out, a silver flask in his hand. 
He was singing loudly, slurring badly. Whenever someone attempted to pass him and enter Vauxhall, he leaned over, half yelling whatever doggerel he was belting out directly at them. Alex, gritting his teeth, rapped on the roof of the carriage, signalling to his driver. The horses were pulled up suddenly, the carriage barely coming to a stop before Alex leapt out onto the pavement, his polished boots hitting the ground with a sense of purpose. As he approached the bench where Richard sat, the Viscount's boisterous singing grew louder accompanied by the sloshing of liquor in his flask. Alex's jaw clenched, his frustration mounting with each step. Richard! His voice cut through the night air like a sharp blade. What in heaven's name are you doing here? Richard looked up, his eyes glazed with intoxication. A lopsided grin spread across his face as he recognised his brother. Alex, come to join the revelry, have you? Come, sit, you can toast with me. Alex's gaze hardened. Hardly. I've come to put an end to this foolishness. He gestured to the flask in Richard's hand. You're making a spectacle of yourself, and by extension our family name. Richard scoffed, taking another swig from the flask. Always so concerned with appearances, aren't you, dear brother? Life's too short to be shackled by society's expectations, he drawled, tipping his hat sardonically to a group of ladies as they hurried past him. Alex's patience wore thin. This isn't about appearances, Richard. It's about responsibility and upholding the honour of our family. He reached out, snatching the flask from his brother's grasp. It's time for you to come home and sober up. Richard stumbled to his feet, swaying slightly. And what if I refuse? Will you drag me back like a naughty child? You're not my governess, he argued petulantly. Alex's eyes narrowed. If that's what it takes to keep you from further disgracing yourself and our family, then yes. He bent down and hauled upward on his brother's elbow. I wish your governess was here, he grunted as he attempted to pull Richard upright. Like a child in the throes of a tantrum, Richard went limp and slipped from Alex's grip, thunking back down onto the bench. Richard's laughter echoed through the park, a bitter and mocking sound. Ever the dutiful duke, aren't you? Always putting the family's reputation above all else. One of us has to, Alex shot back, his voice low and controlled. I'm currently paying the price for my earlier transgressions. Before inheriting the title, I too indulged in a careless life, mingling with commoners, frequenting taverns, and cavorting with women. Well, with her. Richard's eyes widened slightly, surprised by his brother's admission. Alex rarely spoke of his past, always maintaining an air of propriety and decorum. Alex's gaze grew distant for a moment, as if lost in a memory. He shook his head, pushing aside a bittersweet recollection. But that was a lifetime ago. A wall seemed to come down over him, cutting off whatever reverie he had been lost in. Back in its place was the stalwart Duke of Somerton. Richard opened his mouth to retort, but Alexander cut him off with a raised hand. Enough, Richard. I will not tolerate your mockery any longer. It's time for you to grow up and accept the responsibilities that come with being a member of the Somerton family. Alex's grey eyes bored into his brother, his resolve unwavering. I understand the allure of a carefree life, but we have a duty to our family and to society. It's time for you to put aside your selfish pursuits and start behaving like a proper Viscount. Richard's shoulders slumped slightly, the weight of his brother's words sinking in. Alex placed a firm hand on Richard's shoulder. Come, let us return to the manor. Richard, however, had other plans. With a sudden twist of his body, he pulled away from Alex's grasp. Wait, wait, he exclaimed, his words slightly slurred. Sit with me for a moment, dear brother. Surely you can spare a few minutes for a brotherly conversation? Even a duke must have time for a little frivolity, he wheedled. Alex's eyes narrowed, his patience wearing thin. The last thing he wanted was to indulge Richard's drunken whims, especially in a public setting. Yet, as he looked into his brother's pleading eyes, he found himself wavering. There had been a time, forever ago now, when the brothers hadn't needed pretexts to have fun together. 
As Richard looked up at Alex, the Duke could feel his resolve failing, drawn in by their years of boyhood mischief. With a heavy sigh, Alex lowered himself onto the bench beside Richard, his posture stiff and unyielding. The wooden slats creaked beneath his weight. What is it, Richard? Alex asked, his tone clipped and impatient. What could possibly be so important that you feel the need to make a fool of yourself in the middle of London? Richard leaned back against the bench, his head lolling to the side as he regarded Alex with a lopsided grin. Can't a man enjoy a bit of revelry without his brother's constant disapproval? He raised the flask to his lips, taking another swig and smacking his lips. Alex's hand shot out, snatching the flask from Richard's grasp. Enough, Richard. This behaviour is beneath you. He tucked the flask into his jacket pocket, his eyes never leaving his brother's face. What's really going on? Why are you here, drinking yourself into a stupor? Richard's grin faded, replaced by a flicker of something darker, more profound. He leaned forward, his elbows resting on his knees as he stared at the ground. Do you ever feel trapped, Alex? Trapped by the expectations, the responsibilities, the weight of our family name? Alex's brow furrowed, a flicker of understanding dawning in his eyes. He knew all too well the burdens that came with their station, the constant pressure to uphold the family's honour and reputation. Yet he had learned to shoulder those burdens with grace and dignity, never allowing them to consume him. Still, they had both been thrust into the thick of the tun at a young age, their father passing before either of them were in their majority. Of course I do, Alex replied, his voice softening slightly. But drowning yourself in liquor is not the answer, Richard. It never is. We are privileged, and with that comes hard choices, compromises, that we must live with. Though he was ostensibly speaking to his brother, Alex may as well have been speaking to himself. Alex sat beside his brother in tense silence, his mind drifting to the recent encounter with the Harrington sisters. He found himself inexplicably drawn to the memory of Lady Rosalind, the fiery and unconventional middle daughter. Her sharp wit and independent spirit had initially marked her as unsuitable for the role of a duchess. Society demanded grace, poise, and a certain level of decorum from a woman of her station. Yet, as Alex recalled their heated debates and the passion with which Rosalind defended her beliefs, he couldn't help but feel a spark of admiration. It had been a long time since anyone had dared to stand up to him in the way that she did, and Alex was intrigued in spite of himself. In a world where women were expected to be demure and compliant, Rosalind stood out like a beacon of refreshing honesty. She spoke her mind without fear of consequences, challenging the very foundations upon which their aristocratic society was built. As the Duke of Somerton, Alex had always placed great importance on social graces and the ability to navigate the complex web of high society. A future duchess would need to possess the intelligence and sophistication to stand by his side, to be a partner in both life and the responsibilities that came with their title. But as he sat there, lost in thought, Alex found himself questioning the true nature of compatibility. Was it solely about adhering to societal norms and expectations? Or was there something to be said for the spark of connection, the meeting of minds that transcended the superficial? Lady Rosalind, with her flaming red hair and emerald eyes, had managed to capture his attention in a way that few others had. Her passion for knowledge and her unwavering commitment to her beliefs were qualities that Alex found himself drawn to, despite his initial reservations. She seemed the very embodiment of his more carefree youth, the wild idealism he had once entertained. He couldn't help but wonder if perhaps, just perhaps, there was more to her than met the eye. Could she be the one to challenge him, to push him beyond the confines of his own expectations? Alexander's thoughts were interrupted by Richard's voice, tinged with playful curiosity. What's on your mind, dear brother? Richard asked, his eyes glinting with a hint of mischief. You seem rather pensive this evening, even for you. 
Alex hesitated for a moment, unsure whether to share his impressions of the Harrington sisters with his brother. But as Richard's gaze remained fixed upon him, he found himself relenting. I was just thinking about my recent encounter with Lord Harrington's daughters, Alex began, his voice measured and thoughtful. Richard leaned forward, his interest piqued. Ah, yes, the lovely Harrington sisters. Do tell, which one has captured the Duke of Somerton's attention? Alex's brow furrowed slightly as he considered his words. Lady Rosalind, the middle daughter, is quite unconventional, he admitted, his tone guarded but thoughtful. She possesses a sharp wit and an independent spirit that sets her apart from the other ladies of society. Richard's lips curled into a knowing smirk. Lady Rosalind, you say? She's the one with the topping figure, isn't she? He asked, making a vague motion with his hands that indicated a soft, curvaceous body, which made Alex scowl. And all of that red hair, too? It seems she's made quite an impression on you, dear brother. Alex shifted uncomfortably on the bench, his hackles rising at Richard's implication. It's not like that, Richard. I merely find her intriguing in a purely intellectual sense. Richard's laughter echoed through the park, a playful sound that contrasted with Alex's serious demeanour. Intriguing, you say? Could it be that the stoic Duke of Somerton has finally fallen under the spell of a woman's charms? And a firebrand at that? Go on then, go and claim your boudicca. Alex's jaw clenched, his eyes narrowing at Richard's suggestion. Don't be ridiculous, Richard. You know very well that I have no intention of falling in love, not after. He trailed off, the painful memory of his past heartbreak resurfacing. Richard's expression softened, a flicker of understanding passing between the brothers. I know, Alex, but perhaps it's time to open yourself up to the possibility again. Lady Rosalind seems to have a way of challenging your preconceptions. Besides, what's the point of life without a bit of fun and passion? He asked, attempting to snake his hand into Alex's pocket for his flask. Alex shook his head, batting away Richard's hand at the same time, his resolve unwavering. No, Richard. I cannot allow myself to be swayed by fleeting emotions. My duty is to find a suitable duchess one who can uphold the family name and fulfil the responsibilities that come with the title. Oh, come off it, Richard retorted. What, is this Lady Rosalind Harrington prone to howling at the moon? Does she clean her teeth with a knife at breakfast? She's a lady, her reticule is undoubtedly full to bursting with a dowry. What else is there? Alex remained stoically silent, his mouth tight. Richard sighed leaning back against the bench. As you wish, dear brother. But don't dismiss the power of a genuine connection so easily. Sometimes the most unexpected people can change our lives in ways we never imagined. Alexander's expression hardened as Richard's words struck a chord within him. The implication of his liaison with Mary, his former love, sent a jolt of pain through his heart, a wound that had never fully healed. He clenched his jaw, trying to suppress the memories that threatened to resurface. Mary's departure will always be a part of my past, Richard, Alex admitted, his voice strained. But it was for the best. We were not meant to be. Richard leaned forward, his eyes searching Alex's face. And yet, you still carry the hurt with you, even after all these years. Alex's gaze remained fixed on a distant point. The weight of his responsibilities and the unexpected stirrings of his heart battling within him. He had long ago resigned himself to a life of duty, putting the needs of his family and his title above his own desires. Now, with the arrival of Lady Rosalind, Alex found himself questioning the path he had chosen. Her spirited nature had ignited something within him a spark of curiosity and longing that he had thought long extinguished. Richard's voice cut through Alex's thoughts, a rare moment of seriousness in his tone. Perhaps Lady Rosalind is the one who can help you move past your heartbreak, Alex. 
Maybe she's the key to finding happiness once more. Let her be your phoenix burning all of that away, he said thoughtfully, punctuating his words with a swoop of his hand and a whooshing sound of conflagration. Alex remained silent, his mind swirling with conflicting emotions. Could he allow himself to open his heart again, to risk the pain of another loss? Or was he destined to remain trapped in the shadows of his past, forever bound by the chains of his own making? Sat beside his brother, the sounds of merriment wafting from Vauxhall were a symbolic temptation. The prospect of amusement, of delighted senses, was just around the corner. All he had to do was go find it. Alex's mind felt heavy with the weight of recent events. The false rumours circulating about his alleged secret affairs had taken a toll on his reputation, and the frustration simmered beneath his composed exterior. It's preposterous, Alex declared, his voice rising with indignation. These baseless accusations are nothing more than a malicious attempt to tarnish our family name. His hands clenched into fists on his knees. Richard shifted uncomfortably on the bench, his eyes averting Alex's intense gaze. Alex could feel him take a steadying breath next to him, having easily followed the trail of thoughts that had led to Alex's sudden outburst. I understand your frustration, Alex, Richard said, his tone uncharacteristically sombre. But engaging with these rumours will only fuel the fire. The best course of action is to rise above it all and focus on your duties. Isn't that what you're always telling me? Richard cast his eyes down, his own past indiscretions weighing heavily on his conscience. I know the price of scandal all too well, Alex. It's a burden I wouldn't wish upon anyone, least of all you. Alex studied his brother's face, noticing the uncharacteristic unease etched upon his features. Richard's usual carefree demeanour had vanished, replaced by a haunted expression that sent a prickle of foreboding down Alex's spine. Richard, Alex began, his voice low and measured. What is it that troubles you so? Richard shifted on the bench, his fingers fidgeting with the hem of his jacket. He drew in a deep breath, as if steeling himself for the words that were to come. Alex, I must confess something to you and I fear it will not be easy for you to hear. Alex leaned forward, his brow furrowing with suspicion. Speak plainly, brother. What have you done? Richard's gaze dropped to the ground, unable to meet Alex's piercing stare. I have been involved in a scandalous affair, he admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. With Lady Evelyn. The judge's wife, Alex blurted, his face a study in incredulity. Richard nodded, refusing to meet his eyes, keeping his gaze locked firmly on his feet. The words hung heavy in the air between them, and for a moment Alex found himself unable to breathe. His mind reeled with the implications of Richard's revelation, the shock and disbelief coursing through his veins like ice. A burst of distant laughter rang out from behind the hedge of Vauxhall, as if mocking the absurdity of the situation. How could you be so foolish, Richard? Alex demanded, his voice rising with each word. Do you have any idea the damage this could cause to our family's reputation? Richard flinched at the harshness of Alex's tone, his shoulders slumping under the force of his brother's anger. I never meant for it to go this far, Alex. It was a moment of weakness, a lapse in judgment. Alex shook his head, his jaw clenched tight. He could feel his pulse beating rapidly in his temple. And now, your actions have drawn me into this scandal as well. As your elder brother, I'm meant to be responsible for you. This reflects poorly on us both. Alex stood, restless and agitated, and began pacing before the bench. Richard sat sullenly, slouched and defeated. At least this will pull the ton's attention away from you, he muttered. No one will care about whatever they say you've done once this hits the scandal sheets. Alex stopped his pacing, halting mid-stride. Realisation was beginning to dawn on him, a suspicion that turned his stomach to stone. Richard, he asked slowly, his voice low and dangerous. 
Why has the ton begun gossiping about me again? Why now, when I've been nothing but the very model of duty for the past five years? Silence stretched between the two brothers, taut and almost tangible with crackling anger. Richard averted his gaze in any manner he might, folding his arms, then unfolding them. Well, he hedged, I... I may know something about that. It's possible that I used your carriage to go to one of our rendezvous. My carriage, Alex repeated. He drew himself upright, staring down at Richard. Surely you don't mean the crested one. Richard winced, answering the question without speaking. Oh, for Richard, how could you? You know that everyone will recognise the coat of arms on it. The rumours are circulating, Richard, and they mistakenly implicate me as the culprit. Richard's eyes widened, the gravity of his actions finally sinking in. Alex, I never intended for you to be dragged into this mess, I swear it. What were you even thinking? You had to have known that it would be recognised. If you were meant to be carrying on a secret affair, how could you do something so obvious? Alex demanded. With a little shrug, Richard answered weakly. Lady Evelyn liked being seen in it. It was nicer than my coach, and she liked the prestige. Really, brother, believe me, I didn't do this to cause trouble for you. Alex stood abruptly, his hands balled into fists at his sides. Your intentions matter little now, Richard. The damage has been done, and it falls upon me to bear the consequences of your irresponsible conduct. Richard bowed his head in shame, unable to meet his brother's piercing gaze. I am truly sorry, Alex, Richard said, his voice thick with emotion. I will do whatever it takes to make this right, to clear your name and restore our family's honour. Alex resumed his pacing his mind racing with potential solutions to contain the scandal that threatened to engulf his family. The weight of his responsibilities as the head of the Fitzwilliam family bore down upon him. The burden of maintaining their reputation and securing an advantageous match resting heavily on his shoulders. Now, more than ever, it was imperative that he marry well and quickly. He had to secure a match before this powder keg of gossip was well and truly ignited. Richard desperate to make amends, reached up and grasped his brother's arm. Alex, I will do whatever it takes to make this right, he said again. His words tinged with remorse and a newfound determination. A determination that was only somewhat undercut by the fact that his words were still a little slurred, his voice thick with emotion and intoxication in equal measure. I cannot let you bear the consequences of my actions alone. Alex paused, recognising the sincerity in Richard's offer. His anger gradually subsided, replaced by a sense of resolve. Somewhere beneath the mask of drunkenness and dissolution, the brother that had been his constant childhood companion, his most loyal friend, lingered. He knew that they would have to work together to navigate the treacherous waters of scandal and gossip. We must act swiftly, Alex said, his voice firm with determination. The longer we allow these rumours to circulate, the more damage they will cause. Richard nodded, his eyes shining with a newfound sense of purpose. What do you propose we do, Alex? Alex's mind churned with possibilities, weighing the potential risks and rewards of each course of action. He knew that they would have to tread carefully, for one misstep could bring their entire world crashing down around them. We must find a way to divert attention from these rumours, Alex mused, his brow furrowed in concentration. Perhaps a grand gesture, something that will capture the ton's interest and shift their focus away from idle gossip. Richard leaned forward, his expression eager. What did you have in mind, Alex? The sun was well and truly set now and the lamplighters were moving down the streets, tottering about on their stilts. Alex watched them, feeling a kind of kinship for their balancing act, as he was now being forced to perform his own. His thoughts turned to the Harrington sisters and the potential alliance that lay before him. Perhaps in the midst of this chaos, there was an opportunity to secure his family's future and ensure his respectable position.
Richard, sensing Alex's inner turmoil, placed a reassuring hand on his brother's shoulder, a gesture of support and understanding. Alex drew strength from Richard's presence, taking a deep breath and steeling himself for the challenges ahead. Come, Richard, let's go home. Chapter 6 The sounds of barely contained chaos echoed within the Duke of Somerton's townhouse, shattering the weary silence that had settled over the halls. Muffled footsteps and half-shouted, half-whispered words carried down the hall. Alex, his mind still preoccupied with the challenges that lay ahead, had just rung for his valet. He was weary and hoped for an early night, having barely tasted dinner and no desire for brandy and cigars. He'd only managed to slip from his jacket, the valet's fingers still grasping the buttons of his waistcoat when a sharp knock at the door echoed through his dressing room. Your Grace, the servant began, his voice low and urgent. There is a visitor who has arrived at the manor, demanding to speak with you in utmost secrecy, despite the late hour. Alex's brow furrowed, his mind already racing with possibilities. Who could possibly be calling at such an hour, and with such insistence on secrecy? He fixed his gaze upon the servant, his voice steady as he inquired. And who might this visitor be? The servant hesitated for a moment, as if weighing the impact of his next words. It is Lady Rosalind, your grace. She is alone and unchaperoned. Alex's eyes widened in shock, his breath catching in his throat. Lady Rosalind was here at his manor, without a chaperone, in the dead of night. The implications of her presence sent a shiver down his spine, his mind grappling with the potential scandal that could unfold. Lady Rosalind insists on the urgency and importance of the matter at hand, the servant added, his voice laced with a hint of trepidation. Alex drew in a deep breath, his thoughts swirling with a myriad of emotions. What could have driven Rosalind to take such a bold and reckless step? Was she in trouble? Or was there something more sinister at play? He knew that he had to handle this situation with the utmost care and discretion, lest it fuel the already raging fires of scandal that threatened to engulf his family. Has anyone else seen her? Alex demanded. The footman hesitated, shooting a glance to the valet. One of the scullery maids and the hall boy. Others possibly as well. She arrived at the servant's entrance, Your Grace, he added hurriedly. With a curt nod, Alex dismissed the servant. Very well. Show Lady Rosalind to the drawing room and ensure that no one else is aware of her presence. Inform everyone downstairs that if I hear even a whiff of talk about this, then they shall be dismissed without notice and without a character reference. I shall be there shortly. Quickly, Alex let the valet slide his jacket back up onto his shoulders, brushing it down in hurried sweeps. Stealing himself for the encounter, Alex straightened his shoulders and strode out of his dressing room. Despite his sleeping quarters, his footsteps echoing through the silent halls of the manor. Alex's mind raced with a whirlwind of thoughts as he made his way towards the drawing room where Lady Rosalind awaited his presence. His steps were as heavy as his mind as he passed through the dimly lit corridors, a testament to the weight of the impending conversation. His heart thrummed with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, wondering what could have possibly driven the fiery and unconventional young woman to seek him out at such an unseemly hour. Despite his apprehension, there was an undeniable hint of thrill about the whole escapade that made his skin tingle. As Alex entered the drawing room, his gaze fell upon Rosalind. He found himself immediately captivated by her presence. She stood tall and defiant, her scarlet hair threatening to escape its moorings, her emerald eyes glittering with a fierce determination that seemed to fill the entire room with an electrifying energy. She stood near the fireplace, her back initially turned to him, but she turned when he entered the room. The flickering flames cast a warm glow upon her fiery red hair, setting it alight. Rosalind met his gaze unflinchingly, uncowed by the strange circumstances of their meeting. There was no hint of fear or hesitation in her demeanour, only a resolute determination that radiated from every fibre of her being. 
Alex found himself momentarily taken aback by the intensity of her presence, but he quickly composed himself, his voice steady despite the conflict that swirled within him. Lady Rosalind, he greeted, his tone a mixture of formality and curiosity. I must admit your presence here at such an hour is most unexpected. He raised an eyebrow in silent question, his mind racing with possibilities as to what could have brought her to his doorstep in the dead of night. The impropriety of the situation was not lost on him, but the urgency and determination in Rosalind's eyes suggested that there was more to her visit than mere social niceties. As he regarded her, Alex found himself drawn to the fire in her eyes, the strength of her spirit that seemed to fill the room with a palpable energy. Despite the unconventional nature of their meeting, he couldn't help but feel a sense of admiration for the young woman who stood before him, her courage and resolve evident in the way she proudly tossed her head. What brings you here, Lady Rosalind? he asked, his voice gentle yet probing, his curiosity getting the better of him. What matter could be so pressing that it warrants such a clandestine meeting? He waited for her response, his heart beating a little faster in anticipation of the words that would fall from her lips. Whatever the reason for her visit, Alex knew that it would be a moment that would forever change the course of their lives. A turning point in the intricate dance of fate that had brought them together on this fateful night. Chapter 7 Rosalind stood before Alex, her heart pounding beneath her cloak. The drawing room of the Duke's manor seemed to close in around her, the weight of her purpose pressing against her chest. She met Alex's gaze, his eyes wide with a mixture of shock and something else she couldn't quite discern. How did you manage to escape your home unnoticed? Alex demanded, his voice cutting through the tense silence. And with only a cloak to conceal your identity? Rosalind took a deep breath, willing her voice to remain steady despite the tremors that threatened to betray her inner turmoil. Your Grace, the purpose of my visit is worth every risk I have taken. She stepped forward, the hem of her cloak brushing against the plush carpet. The firelight cast dancing shadows across Alex's face, highlighting the sharp angles of his jawline and the intensity of his stare. I have come to make a proposition. Rosalind declared, her words hanging in the air between them. One that concerns the future of both our families. Alex raised one dark eyebrow, his posture stiffening. And what proposition might that be, Lady Rosalind? Rosalind's fingers curled into the fabric of her cloak, anchoring herself as she prepared to unveil her plan. I am here to offer myself as your bride, Your Grace. The words seemed to echo in the drawing room the silence that followed thick with tension. Alex's eyes widened further, his lips parting in surprise. You, you came here to propose? He asked, his voice laced with disbelief. You are proposing to me? Rosalind nodded, her resolve unwavering. Yes, Your Grace. I believe it is in the best interest of both our families. She took a step closer, her voice dropping to a whisper. My sisters, Amelia and Isabella, they, they could not bear a marriage of this sort. It isn't in their natures, and I would not see their hearts shackled in such a way. Alex studied her, his eyes searching hers as if truly seeing her for the first time. And what of your own heart, Lady Rosalind? Are you truly willing to sacrifice your own chance at love for the sake of your sisters? Rosalind's lips curved into a wry smile. We may be frank with one another. My chances of finding a husband that would love me, independence and all, were always vanishingly small. Besides, there is nothing I wouldn't do to ensure the continued happiness of my sisters. If my sacrifice can ensure their happiness, then it is a price I am willing to pay. She paused, letting her words sink in. Your grace, she continued, her voice trembling with emotion. I know that my proposal may seem sudden and unconventional, but I assure you it comes from a place of love and devotion to my sisters. If Amelia were to be forced into a loveless marriage, it would shatter her very soul, Rosalind said, her voice cracking with the weight of her words. I cannot bear to see her dreams crushed, 
not when I have the power to prevent it. She turned away from the Duke, staring into the fire but not really seeing it. Isabella's spirit would wither and die if she were confined to a life of duty and obligation, Rosalind said, her words filled with raw honesty and vulnerability. You've seen how she paints, how she puts her whole heart into it. The Duke nodded. Can you imagine her if she were shut up in some grand house, cut off from doing what she loves? She deserves the chance to find her own happiness, free from the constraints of societal expectations. As Rosalind laid bare her fears and hopes, she could see the shift in Alex's demeanour. His initial shock gave way to a growing admiration, his eyes softening as he listened intently to her words. She could feel the weight of his gaze upon her, the way he seemed to see straight into her very soul. I know that our union would be one of duty and responsibility, Rosalind said, her voice steady despite the emotions that threatened to overwhelm her. But I believe that together we could forge a partnership built on mutual respect and a shared sense of purpose. We would enter into our marriage free from any clouds of sentimentality. She took a step closer to Alex, her eyes pleading with him to consider her offer. Your Grace, I ask that you see the potential in this arrangement, the opportunity to protect not only your own reputation, but the happiness of my beloved sisters as well. Rosalind's heart raced as she awaited Alex's response, the silence stretching between them like an endless chasm. She knew that her fate, and the fate of her sisters, rested in his hands. And yet, despite the uncertainty that loomed before her, she found solace in the knowledge that she had done everything in her power to protect those she loved most. Chapter 8 Alex stood before Rosalind, his mind reeling from the unexpected proposal she had just laid at his feet. The candlelight cast shadows across her face, accentuating the surprising determination etched in her delicate features. He found himself captivated by the fire in her emerald eyes, a blaze that seemed to pierce through the very fabric of his being. Lady Rosalind, he began, his voice low and measured, you must understand the gravity of what you are suggesting. A marriage, even one born of necessity, is not a matter to be taken lightly. Rosalind lifted her chin in defiance. I am well aware of the implications, Your Grace. But I am also aware of the love and devotion I hold for my sisters. If sacrificing my own happiness can secure theirs, then it is a price I am willing to pay. Alex felt a flicker of admiration for her selflessness. There was little doubt that she was as devoted to her family as he was to his own. The prospect of having that same loyalty fixed upon himself and his legacy was an appealing one. Still, he hesitated. Have you never entertained dreams of a union based on love? A wistful smile played upon her lips. Dreams are a luxury afforded to those who have the freedom to pursue them. As a daughter of the nobility, my path has always been predetermined. But in this moment, I choose to forge my own destiny, to protect those I hold dear. If I must marry for the security of my sisters, then I should like to at least do it on my terms. The sincerity in her words struck a chord within Alex, resonating with his own sense of responsibility and honour. He found himself drawn to the strength that emanated from her a strength born of love and sacrifice. You speak of duty and obligation, Rosalind continued, her voice softening. But have you ever considered the possibility of finding something more? Of discovering a partnership built on mutual respect and understanding? Alex's heart quickened at her words, a flicker of hope igniting within him, but he quickly tamped it down. There was no room for sentimentality in the duties of a duke. Carefully, he arranged his features into an unreadable mask. He was not quick enough, however, for Rosalind's eyes caught whatever he had been attempting to hide. Her brows twitched slightly in a silent question, and then she blinked as some sort of understanding dawned on her face. I understand that you likely have your own expectations that you bring to marriage. I also will not pretend that it's impossible you have had your own past, your own trials of the heart. 
I do not claim that I can assuage whatever those might be, but we might at least find honest companionship within each other. After all, we would have the benefit of complete and total honesty. As she spoke, Alex found himself drawn to the warmth and empathy that radiated from her. The walls he had so carefully constructed around his heart began to crack, a sliver of light seeping through the darkness. You are a remarkable woman, Lady Rosalind, he murmured, his voice laced with a newfound admiration. Your courage and loyalty are truly commendable. He paused, regarding her in a new light. You're far more perceptive than I had originally credited you with being. As their conversation deepened, the drawing room seemed to transform into a sanctuary, a space where they could explore the possibilities of a future together. Rosalind's words were laced with a cautious hope, a vulnerability that Alex found himself mirroring as he shared his own desires and fears. I have long believed that duty was the only thing I might be able to build a marriage on, Alex confessed, his voice low and tinged with a hint of sadness. But in your presence, Lady Rosalind, I find myself questioning the very foundations upon which I have built my life. Rosalind's gaze softened, her hand reaching out to gently touch his own. The contact sent a jolt of electricity through Alex's body, igniting a spark that he had thought long extinguished. The boldness of the gesture, of a young woman initiating contact in such a manner, made the Duke's heart skip a beat. Perhaps it is time to rewrite the rules, Your Grace, she whispered, her voice filled with a quiet determination. The weight of her words settled upon him, forcing him to confront the reality of their situation. Reluctantly, he tore himself away from her wide eyes and paced the drawing room, his footsteps echoing against the polished wooden floors as he grappled with the magnitude of the decision that lay before him. On a practical level, Alex recognised the strategic advantages that a match with the Harrington family could bring. The Harringtons were well respected and influential in society, and a union with one of their daughters would undoubtedly strengthen his own position and political standing. A dowry from any one of them would be enough to secure his legacy for generations. It was a calculated move, one that could offer alliances and open doors to new opportunities. However, as Alex continued to contemplate Rosalind's proposal, he found himself increasingly drawn to the woman herself. Her intelligence and quick wit had captured his attention from the moment they first met, and her unwavering dedication to her family was a testament to her strength of character. Rosalind possessed a fire within her, a passion for life that burned brightly and refused to be extinguished by societal expectations. She was almost startlingly forthright, a refreshing change from the usual shy and retiring young ladies that were flung at him from every direction. Alex's gaze lingered on Rosalind's face, studying the determined set of her soft jaw. Her eyes, a vibrant green that reminded him of the lush gardens of his estate, held a depth of emotion that stirred something within him. In that moment, he saw beyond the facade of a society lady, and glimpsed the true essence of Rosalind Harrington. Yet, even as Alex found himself captivated by Rosalind's presence, the scars of his past heartbreak began to throb with a dull ache. The memory of Mary, the woman who had shattered his belief in love, resurfaced like a phantom, whispering doubts and fears into his ear. He had long since resigned himself to a life without the warmth and comfort of a true partnership, convinced that love was nothing more than a fleeting illusion. As he stood there face to face with Rosalind, her words ringing in his ears and her eyes searching his own, Alex felt a flicker of something he had thought long extinguished. A spark of hope. A whisper of possibility that perhaps, just perhaps, there could be more to a marriage than mere duty and obligation. The internal battle ragged within him, his head and his heart at odds with each other. The practical, logical side of him urged coaching reminding him of the risks and the potential for further heartache. Yet the part of him that had been touched by Rosalind's sincerity and courage longed to take a leap of faith, to embrace the chance for something more. As the silence stretched between them, heavy with anticipation and unspoken emotions, Alex knew that he stood at a crossroads. 
The decision he made in this moment would shape not only his own future, but the lives of those around him. The yoke of responsibility pressed upon his shoulders, urging him to consider the far-reaching consequences of his actions. Alex regarded Rosalind with a mixture of curiosity and admiration as he sought to unravel the intricacies of her bold proposition. He leaned forward, his eyes locked on hers, and posed a question that had been burning in his mind since she first stepped into his drawing room. Lady Rosalind, your commitment to your sisters is truly remarkable, and your willingness to sacrifice your own happiness for their sake is a testament to your character. But I must ask, what do you envision for our potential partnership? What expectations do you hold for a marriage between us? Your Grace, I believe that a successful marriage is built upon a foundation of mutual respect, trust, and understanding. I seek a partnership where both individuals have the freedom to grow, to pursue their passions, and to support one another in their endeavours, she answered plainly and without preamble. Her words carried a quiet strength, a conviction that resonated deep within Alex's soul. Rosalind continued her voice steady despite the slight tremble in her hands that Alex caught from the corner of his eye. I am not content to be a mere ornament in society, to spend my days in idle gossip and frivolous pursuits. I crave intellectual stimulation, the opportunity to engage in meaningful discussions and to make a difference in the world around me. Alex inclined his head, considering. And what of the traditional duties of a duchess? he asked his tone more curious than challenging. Are you prepared to fulfil the obligations that come with such a title? Rosalind met his gaze unflinchingly, her resolve unwavering. I am not seeking to shirk my responsibilities, Your Grace. I understand the importance of maintaining the social standing and reputation of our families, and I have been helping my sister to run our household since our mother passed. I believe that a true partnership allows for both individuals to thrive, to find fulfilment beyond the confines of societal expectations. As she spoke, Rosalind's words painted a vivid picture of a future where they could stand side by side, equals in every sense of the word. A future where they could challenge each other, inspire each other, and grow together in ways that defied the rigid strictures of their world. It was easy to fall into this vision of the future. Alex had no doubt that Rosalind had the fortitude to take on the tan and bend it to her will. Alex found himself captivated by the passion in her voice, the sincerity that shone in her eyes. He had never encountered a woman who possessed such a fierce determination to forge her own path, to carve out a destiny that was entirely her own. And what of love, Lady Rosalind? he asked softly struggling against the thorny brambles that had grown around his own heart. Do you believe that love has a place in a marriage such as ours? Rosalind's gaze softened, a flicker of understanding passing between them. I believe that love can grow, Your Grace, even in the most unexpected of circumstances, but I'm not naive enough to expect it from the outset. What I seek is a partnership built on honesty love, is not a requirement for a happy marriage. Alexander Fitzwilliam, Duke of Somerton, found himself captivated by the woman standing before him. He was in very great danger of forming an attachment to her, of allowing himself to even begin to love her. In Rosalind, he recognised a kindred spirit, a woman who dared to dream beyond the limitations imposed upon them by their world. Her unconventional approach to marriage her desire for a partnership built on mutual respect and shared purpose ignited a spark of hope within him. It was a vision that both thrilled and terrified him, a leap into the unknown that held the potential for unimaginable rewards. He reached out, his fingertips grazing the delicate skin of Rosalind's hand, emboldened by her words. When they touched, a spark leapt between them, a tangible reminder of the connection that had sparked between them. In that moment, Alex knew that he could no longer deny the pull he felt towards her, the undeniable attraction that went beyond mere physical desire. Alex stood transfixed as a log in the fire cracked and split open, sending flames licking higher in the fireplace. 
the soft golden glow cast a warm hue upon Rosalind's face, illuminating the hope and an unexpected vulnerability that shimmered in her eyes. In that moment, Alex could feel the precipice he was balanced on, caught between possibility and duty, of a future of his own making, or one that had already been written for him. Even as his heart yearned to embrace the possibilities that Rosalind presented, Alex knew that he could not make such a life-altering decision on a whim. The weight of his responsibilities, the expectations placed upon him as the Duke of Somerton, demanded careful consideration and thoughtful deliberation. With a deep breath, Alex stepped backwalk, breaking the invisible connection between them. Lady Rosalind, your proposal has given me much to contemplate. The vision you have painted of our potential future together is one that I find myself drawn to. However, I must approach this decision with the gravity it deserves, he said coolly, composed in spite of the wild beating of his heart. Rosalind nodded, her eyes shining with a mixture of understanding and tentative hope. She did not protest, clearly recognising the magnitude of the choice that lay before Alex, the implications it held not only for their own lives, but for the lives of those around them. I understand your grace she replied, her voice gentle yet filled with conviction. I know that this is not a decision to be made lightly, but I want you to know that whatever path you choose, I will always be grateful that you heard me out, letting me speak my mind freely. Alex felt a surge of admiration for Rosalind's grace and composure, even in the face of such uncertainty. He reached out again, unable to stop himself as his fingertips touched her arm in a gesture of reassurance. I promise you, Lady Rosalind, that I will give your proposal the careful consideration it deserves. You have challenged my perceptions and stirred something within me that I cannot ignore. With a final nod of understanding, Rosalind turned to leave, the skirt of her grey wool redingote swishing softly against the polished wooden floors. Alex watched as she disappeared through the doorway, his heart heavy with the weight of the decision that lay before him. As the door clicked shut behind her, Alex found himself alone in the drawing room, the silence broken only by the distant chirping of birds outside the window in the pre-dawn greyness. He stood there, his gaze fixed upon the empty space where Rosalind had once stood, the ghost of her presence lingering in the air. He remained rooted to the spot, reluctant to leave, half afraid that to do so would wake him and he would find that all of this had been a dream. As the first light of dawn continued to creep through the windows, casting a soft glow upon his face, Alex knew that the coming days would be filled with soul-searching and introspection. He would need to weigh the potential risks and rewards of Rosalind's proposal. To consider also the impact it would have not only on his own life, but on the lives of those around him. Still, even as the uncertainty of the future loomed before him, Alex couldn't help but feel a flicker of excitement, a sense of anticipation for the journey that lay ahead. Rosalind had awakened a part of him that he had long thought dormant, a desire for something more than the confines of societal expectations. And so, with a deep breath and a resolute nod, Alex turned away from the empty drawing room. His mind consumed by thoughts of the unexpected path that fate had placed before him and the woman who had so boldly challenged his perceptions of love and marriage. Chapter 9 As Alex stepped into the grand foyer of Harrington House, his eyes were immediately drawn to the intricate plasterwork that adorned the walls and the gleaming marble floor beneath his feet. The house buzzed with activity, servants scurrying about to attend to their daily duties, while the faint sound of a piano melody drifted from one of the distant rooms. He held his hat in his hands, turning it around and around by the brim mindlessly before a footman glided forward to take it and his gloves. Lord Harrington emerged from his study, his expression a mixture of surprise and curiosity as he approached Alex, his hand outstretched in greeting. Your Grace, what an unexpected pleasure to have you visit our humble abode. To what do we owe the honour of your presence? Were we expecting you? Did Lady Amelia forget to inform me of a visit? He asked, his brow furrowing slightly. 
Alex, his voice steady and confident, met Lord Harrington's gaze with unwavering determination. Lord Harrington, I have come to formally express my intention to court your daughter, Lady Rosalind. I believe that our union could bring great benefits to both our families, and I wish to further our acquaintance to explore the potential of a future together. Lord Harrington's eyebrows raised slightly, clearly taken aback by the Duke's declaration. Rosalind, he blurted, his eyes flicking down the hall and back to the Duke. I mean, that is your grace, I must admit that your interest in Rosalind comes as a surprise, Lord Harrington replied, recovering quickly. She is not the most traditional of young ladies, and I fear that her independent nature may not be well suited to the expectations of a duchess. Amelia, on the other hand. Alex, undeterred by Lord Harrington's reservations, pressed on, raising a hand. It is precisely her independent spirit and quick mind that have drawn me to her, Lord Harrington. I believe that a partnership built on mutual respect and understanding could flourish between us, and I am eager to explore that possibility further. Lord Harrington paused, considering Alex's words. Alex could almost see the arithmetic that Lord Harrington was doing in his head at the announcement. The alliance could bring great prestige and influence to the Harrington family, and he knew that Rosalind's future would be secure with a man of Alex's standing. However, should the Duke find Rosalind's propensity for independent thought, not to his taste after all and publicly cut her, her reputation and likely that of her sisters, would suffer. It was a risk. Very well, Your Grace. Lord Harrington conceded, his tone still laced with a hint of scepticism. I grant you permission to court Rosalind. I trust that you will treat her with the utmost respect and propriety. He paused. The weather seems to be rather fine today. Perhaps you might promenade with her in the park? She needs a reason to be taken from the library, he added. Alex bowed his head in gratitude, a small smile tugging at the corners of his lips. Of course, Lord Harrington. I would be glad to. As Lord Harrington nodded his assent, Alex felt a surge of anticipation course through his veins. A footman was dispatched to summon Rosalind and to find her maid so that she might be readied for her outing. The opportunity to spend time with Rosalind, to delve deeper into the fascinating depths of her mind and heart, filled him with a sense of excitement and purpose. He found himself balancing eagerly on the balls of his feet, full of delighted anticipation. When Rosalind presented herself, Alex found himself fighting to keep a broad smile from his face. She was resplendent in a lavender pelisse and a green cotton daydress that made her red hair seem even redder. Like him, she kept her expression tightly controlled, but there was a glint of eagerness and curiosity in her eyes that followed Alex carefully. Alex bowed to her, unwilling or unable to take his eyes from her for even a moment. Good afternoon, Your Grace she said. I understand you were concerned about my need for fresh air. Lady Rosalind, the Duke replied, not rising to her bait just yet. Rosalind inclined her head, a playful tilt to her mouth. My sister has agreed to act as chaperone, she said, nodding to Lady Amelia, who was waiting some steps away. The Duke nodded, and without further ceremony, they were discharged out into the brisk spring air and made their way to St. James's Park. As they walked in companionable silence, with Amelia trailing a polite distance behind, the beauty of St. James's Park was on full display. The lush green lawns stretched out before them, dotted with vibrant flowers and towering trees that provided a canopy of shade. The gentle breeze carried the sweet scent of blooming roses, and the distant sound of chirping birds filled the air. The tun, too, was out in all their feathers and ruffles as eager to see as to be seen. For all the natural beauty, it was Rosalind's presence that truly captivated Alex's attention. There was a sort of natural magnetism to her, even when she wasn't speaking. Still, Alex was determined to know her better, to see what he might tease out of her. She was not inclined to mindless chatter, however, and seemed thoroughly disinclined to speak, unless she had something worthy to say. I understand from your father that you have been much in the library today, he offered. Rosalind gave him a sidelong glance, clearly unimpressed with such a banal statement. I have been, 
she confirmed politely enough, though. Much to my father's distress, she added. Alex felt a corner of his mouth tug upward a little. What have you been studying for so many hours? Her step slowed and stopped, and Alex, surprised, turned back to face her. Her green eyes boldly swept over him, assessing, and he couldn't help but draw himself up a bit in response. Do you really wish to know, or are you merely attempting to make polite conversation? From behind Rosalind, Alex could see Amelia put her hand on her forehead and sigh. For his part, he appreciated the directness. It may surprise you to know that I am genuinely interested. I've been reading the works of Afra Bain, Rosalind said, staring directly into Alex's eyes, unflinching. She was possibly the first British woman to make her living by her pen alone without the support of a man. I know her work, the Duke replied. I understand your father's distress a little more clearly now. Do you? Rosalind returned, one of her brows arching. Do you also find her work unsuitable, morally depraved, without merit? Alex shrugged. It does seem... A little unseemly for a young lady, I will admit. Unseemly, Rosalind huffed. She began walking again, her stride quick and determined, and Alex had to stretch his legs to catch up. And yet, none of the same condemnation for Wilmot and his bawdy verses. That's different, Alex protested. Why, Rosalind demanded. Is he permitted because he is a man, or because he is a peer? Well, I... Because if a subject is unsuitable for writing about, then it is simply unsuitable no matter who is writing, Rosalind continued. The words don't know if they are being written by a man or a woman, so the meaning is the same. If it's because of social status, then I ask, why were nobles created in the first place? Alex tilted his head, his brow creasing a little as he thought. He'd never considered such a question in his life. I imagine because they performed a service for a king and were duly rewarded. Ah, that is it precisely, Rosalind cried, turning toward Alex again. Miss Bain likewise served the king, acting as a spy in Antwerp for Charles II at his personal behest. There, she has done a service to the king and is therefore exactly as worthy as any other peer. Now it was Alex's turn to stop walking, his boots planted on the gravel path. Rosalind did not seem to notice for a moment and continued on. She stopped several steps ahead of him, and when she turned around, the Duke felt his breath catch in his chest. Her cheeks were flushed from the cool breeze and exercise, but her eyes were shining with the passion of her argument. She stood straight and didn't attempt to diminish her bearing in any way so that she would appear lighter, more delicate. She was, in a word, magnificent. Alex was aware that he was just staring at her, but he didn't care. Rosalind, too, did not seem to care, the tone of her gaze playful and daring. Have I shocked and appalled you, Your Grace? she asked, her tone fairly challenging. No, he answered with a slow shake of his head, coming to stand with her again. I was just imagining the fireworks that would ensue if I took you to court. Rosalind laughed fully and without hesitation, her head tilted back, white teeth flashing. I'm sure that would be my first and only audience with the royals. Probably, Alex agreed, though the Queen is rather a force to be reckoned with herself. Well, if you should like to avoid further nasty shocks, I suggest you stick to the approved scripts for these sorts of outings, Rosalind said. Which is? We might discuss the weather. How many people are out today? The latest hunt you attended? She ticked them off on her fingers, her dark purple kid gloves emphasising her points. I think I'd far rather ask your opinion on the Prime Minister, Alex said. Oh? It will at the least be far more entertaining, and I suspect a great deal more stimulating, he said with a nod. Rosalind laughed again, which made Alex grin. Alex found himself increasingly drawn to her, his gaze lingering on the delicate curve of her cheek and the way the sunlight danced in her fiery red hair. There was a depth to Rosalind that he had never encountered before. It was a sense of authenticity and raw honesty 
that stripped away the pretenses of society and left him feeling both exhilarated and exposed. Feeling emboldened, Alex allowed himself to walk a little closer to Rosalind, the back of his hand brushing hers. To his delight, she coloured prettily and bit her lip. A pointed cough from behind them had Alex folding his hands behind his back. Rosalind tossed a glance over her shoulder to Amelia, which made Alex chuckle to himself. How are your sisters, if I might risk a foray into more mundane conversation? Well enough, thank you, Rosalind replied automatically, with none of the feeling he expected from her. Suspicious, Alex lowered his voice. I'm not looking for gossip, Lady Rosalind, he said quietly. I think that you know well enough by now my feelings on that point. True enough, Rosalind allowed. They walked in silence for a moment, round a corner in the path. Her expression was troubled, her eyes distant as she clearly wrestled with something internally. In the spirit of the honesty which I promised you, I suppose I might tell you that I am troubled on their behalf, Isabella in particular. The Duke nodded. He had seen the solicitous care that the other Harrington sisters had tended to the youngest, and his heart was all sympathy for them. There was a sad, melancholy air that clung to Isabella, a heaviness in her movements that gave the girl gravity beyond her years. Isabella had been shy and reserved from the first, but over the weeks she had become so wan and quiet that she seemed in danger of simply disappearing. What troubles her so? Alex inquired. Rosalind hesitated again, her steps slowing. She glanced over to Alex, searching his face, and he suspected that she was attempting to decide how much to trust him. He evidently passed whatever test she had been mentally putting him through, for she answered with unvarnished plainness. I think the reality of her life is bearing down on her, this whole business. She gestured vaguely between herself and the Duke has brought to light that her future is already written for her, and it's not a story that she wishes to be the main character in. Ah, Alex said, nodding. I can empathise with that well enough. A pause. Is this why she hasn't been presented at court? Partly, Rosalind admitted, but I think also she simply doesn't wish to be labelled as on the marriage market. Does she not wish to marry? Alex asked, surprised. No, I think she very much does. She has a lot of love to give to the right person. The problem is, who could she marry that would allow her to continue to paint as she does? It's a conundrum, Rosalind said unhappily. As an older brother himself, Alex couldn't help but feel a measure of sympathy for Rosalind's position. More than that, he did not care one jot for the way her mouth turned down at the corners, her concern and feeling for her sister suffusing her entire expression. He found himself wanting desperately to put things right for her, to restore the bright smile to her face. Perhaps I can help, he heard his mouth saying before he knew what was happening. You? How? Rosalind blurted. Well, he said slowly, the plan forming as he said it. Why not take her to an exhibition of some sort? Let her see how the other half lives. Rosalind bit her lip again, her brow furrowed in thought. It would be good to get her out of the attic for a bit, she allowed, but I am worried that it will simply discourage her more. A grin flitted over Alex's face. I think I know exactly the artist's works she should see, he said, and afterwards we can take her to get iced cream. There's a patisserie that sells some over near Bond Street. We should surprise her, Rosalind said, her face becoming animated again. I won't tell her what we're doing. That way there's no expectation. Everything will just be a delightful surprise for her. What do you think, Amelia? Rosalind asked, turning around and walking backwards for a moment to gauge her sister's reaction. To Alex's relief and pleasure, Amelia's eyes were glistening with emotion, and she nodded enthusiastically. She'll love it, she agreed softly. It will take her out of herself. Delightedly, Rosalind squealed a little and clapped her hands together. In her happy enthusiasm, she pirouetted back around and grasped the Duke's elbow with both hands. Amelia, evidently too pleased to protest, said nothing in objection, which in turn greatly pleased Alex. 
As Alex, Rosalind and Amelia returned to the Harrington Manor, they were unified in their plan to help the youngest Harrington. As Alex deposited Lady Rosalind and her sister safely back in their house, he promised that he would send a card over the very moment he had the details settled. Strangely enough, it didn't feel like a chore as other social engagements frequently had. Chapter 10 As the date for Isabella's impending outing approached, Rosalind found herself wanting to spend more and more time in the company of the Duke of Somerton. The initial animosity between them had gradually given way to a growing sense of mutual respect and admiration, their conversations flowing with an ease and familiarity that surprised them both. When the appointed date arrived, Rosalind hurried Isabella through her morning toilette, giddy with anticipation. So eager was she that she found herself nearly snatching the brush out of the maid's hands so that she might pin up Isabella's hair all the faster. For her part, Isabella endured all of this with a languid, disinterested air, which only served to heighten Rosalind's impatience to depart. Isabella managed to rouse herself a little when she spotted the Duke's grand carriage waiting for them outside the house. The Duke himself stood next to it and offered the sisters a deep bow in greeting. She cast a dubious glance to Rosalind, who only smiled and took her hand. Don't you worry, my little rosebud, she said. There are only good surprises today. Hesitatingly, Isabella allowed herself to be handed up into the carriage. Within, Rosalind could still sense her unease, the way that she attempted to squeeze herself deep into the corner. Thank you for the ride, Your Grace, Rosalind said, attempting to keep the excitement from her voice. Not at all, Lady Rosalind, he returned formally. His own face was alight with bemusement, clearly enjoying the subterfuge. The journey was largely spent in silence, the richly upholstered carriage surprisingly comfortable as it rolled over the uneven London streets. Rosalind and the Duke engaged in polite conversation, which felt oddly impersonal given their usual honesty, but they didn't wish to give anything away. Isabella stared silently out the window as London passed by. They stopped in front of a plain townhouse, the façade plain but lovely in its symmetry. There were a number of other carriages there, with people regularly disembarking. We're here, Rosalind announced, seizing Isabella's hand. Come on, Bitty Bella, you don't want to miss this, she said, using the baby name they'd called Isabella, encouraging her up. Isabella, once out of the carriage, put her hand to the back of her bonnet to steady it as she looked up dubiously at the house. Where, where are we? she asked. This is Lord Percival Tyrell's London residence, the Duke said, coming up behind them. The famous collector? Isabella asked, her eyes sparking a little. The same, the Duke confirmed. Shall we? he said, gesturing towards the door with his walking stick. That was all the encouragement it took to get them inside. From the moment they entered, Isabella's pale blue eyes were wide with wonder, her rosebud mouth open in silent appreciation. Rosalind watched her with satisfaction, glad that her plan was already working and they were only in the vestibule. There were two small marble statues in little alcoves, Cupid and Psyche, and Isabella was immediately drawn to them, murmuring about their shape and form. I think it's working, Alex whispered to Rosalind. She hadn't realised how close he was standing, and the play of his words on her ear made her shiver a little. I think so too, Rosalind replied. They stood for a moment side by side, their shoulders nearly touching as they watched Isabella flit about. If you saw me, perhaps you would fear me, perhaps adore me but all I ask of you is to love me. I would rather you would love me as an equal than adore me as a god, the Duke quoted quietly, staring at the statue of Cupid. Surprised, Rosalind turned to him. I must confess I never took you for a lover of poetry, Your Grace, Rosalind remarked, a playful smile tugging at the corners of her lips. Alex chuckled, his gaze warm as it met hers. There is much about me that might surprise you, Lady Rosalind, just as there is much about you that continues to intrigue me. Rosalind felt a flush creep up her neck at his words, 
her heart fluttering in her chest. In that moment, caught in the intensity of his gaze, she found herself lowering her guard, revealing a part of herself she rarely shared with others. I have always dreamed of using my position to effect positive change in the world, she confessed, her voice soft but filled with conviction. To make a difference in the lives of those less fortunate than myself. Alex's eyes widened, a flicker of admiration dancing within their depths. It seems we share a similar passion then. I too have long held the desire to create a more just and equitable society. As they spoke, their hands brushed against each other accidentally, sending a jolt of electricity through their bodies. They stared into each other's eyes, and Rosalind found herself swallowing hard, her mouth suddenly dry. Come on, Rosalind, Isabella said, breaking the spell. We must see the rest of the collection. With a rueful smile, Rosalind turned her attention back to her sister. Linking arms together, Rosalind gently guided her through a series of rooms, all hung with an astonishing amount of paintings. Isabella protested, digging in her heels and demanding to see the pieces they were simply passing by. Patience, Isabella, Rosalind said. We're going to see something very special indeed. At last they came to a spacious hall which was populated with a number of easels. On these, a collection of oil paintings stood, with a number of people clustered around, admiring them. Rosalind, not wishing to give anything away, made a great show of casualness, but watched Isabella surreptitiously from the corner of her eye. These are quite good, Isabella murmured, leaning forward to look closer at a painting of a woman seated at an easel, while an older woman peered around to gaze at the painting within a painting. These await, Isabella said, glancing about at all of the canvases. These are by Sharples. Oh, they're exquisite she said. I'm delighted you think so, a gentle voice said from behind them. Rosalind and Isabella turned, and there in a fashionable white dress stood a rather unassuming woman with dark hair and playful eyes on the arm of the Duke, who was grinning like a child who'd stolen the last biscuit. Lady Rosalind, Lady Isabella, may I present Miss Rolinda Sharples? Miss Sharples, Ladies Rosalind and Isabella Harrington the Duke said, still smiling. Miss Sharples, Rosalind said as they exchanged polite bows, I am so delighted to meet you. My sister here is quite an admirer of your work. So I gathered, Miss Sharples replied with a glint in her eye. Tell me, Lady Isabella, are you an admirer of the arts? Isabella opened her mouth to answer, but no sound came out. She shrank back a little partially hidden behind Rosalind. Rosalind recognised this posture well, it being a constant in their childhood. Refusing to allow this opportunity to pass her sister by, Rosalind stiffened her grip on Isabella's arm. She's more than an admirer, Rosalind said proudly. She's an artist herself. Miss Sharples's eyes lit up with interest. Are you indeed? Come then, my dear, you must tell me all about your work. And with that, she inserted herself between Isabella and Rosalind, taking the former by the arm. Speaking in low, gentle tones, as if she innately understood Isabella's shyness, the artist began squiring the girl around the room, pausing occasionally to discuss a painting. Rosalind watched with a mix of pride and fondness. She could feel the Duke's presence beside her, a kind of charge in the air about him. I can't thank you enough for arranging this. Rosalind said, nodding toward Isabella. It means so much to her, and, and to me. It was very much my pleasure. You are an extraordinary woman, Rosalind, he murmured, his voice low and sincere. Never doubt that. The qualities that make you unique, that set you apart from others, are what make you so incredibly special. Rosalind's breath caught in her throat her heart swelling with an emotion she dared not name. In that moment, lost in the depths of his eyes, she felt a connection to Alex that transcended the boundaries of their social positions and the expectations placed upon them. As they stood there, surrounded by beautiful things, Rosalind and Alex began to see each other in a new light. 
the initial prejudices and misconceptions fell away, replaced by a deeper understanding and appreciation of the complex individuals they truly were. Rosalind was delighted to find that beneath the Duke's exterior of duty and propriety, there was a real heart beating, a truly generous soul. Of course, Lord Tyrell was all too happy to help me with the arrangements, the Duke said. In fact, he was rather keen to meet Lady Isabella as well. Was he? Why? Rosalind asked, her protective instinct surging to the fore. He's always on the lookout for new extraordinary talent, and I believe it's safe to say that means your sister, Alex said with a nod toward her. He has quite an eye for it. In fact, there he is now, he said, dipping his head at a tall, tow-headed man across the hall. Lord Tyrrell, spotting the Duke, smiled widely and made his way over. Your Grace, he said affably, clapping the Duke on the shoulder jovially. I am delighted you were able to attend today. Delighted. Now tell me, is this charming young lady the one who wished to meet our Miss Sharples? No, Percival, the Duke said with a shake of his head. This is Lady Rosalind Harrington, Baron Harrington's middle daughter. Ah, well, I am pleased to make your acquaintance then, Lord Tyrrell said accepting Rosalind's hand as if she were a man, and shaking it vigorously. Pleased, very pleased. I understand it was for your sister's benefit that this meeting was arranged. It was, my lord, Rosalind replied, blinking and gently extricating her hand from Lord Tyrrell's enthusiastic grip. Ah, there she is now, she said, happy to see that she had linked arms with Miss Sharples. Their heads were close together in private conference, with Isabella nodding emphatically. Ah, Miss Sharples, Lord Tyrrell said, the smile on his face widening. So you have met His Grace's young friend then. Wonderful, just wonderful. Isabella and Rosalind exchanged a knowing sort of glance between themselves, the sort often shared by sisters that have mastered the art of silent communication. Rosalind suspected that Lord Tyrrell was the sort of happy person that could find happiness in the most mundane of circumstances. There was a sort of overeager, puppy-like aspect to him that was endearing and somewhat undercut his classical, chiselled good looks. After the requisite introductions with bows and curtsies were completed, Rosalind spoke up. Lord Tyrrell, I understand that you are quite the patron of the arts. Oh yes, he said, nodding so that his straw-coloured curls bobbed against his forehead. Ever since I was a young lad... I've had a passion for supporting any and all artistic endeavours. Your collection is breathtaking, Isabella remarked, her eyes shining with admiration. Rosalind was surprised, but delighted by the steady, confident tenor of her voice. He has a real eye for recognising talent, Miss Sharples agreed with a self-satisfied smile. And recognising a lack of talent too, the Duke muttered darkly. Rosalind turned a querying look on him, and he shrugged. I had thought once that I might be a great gentleman artist. It, ah, uh, it did not work out as I had hoped. Oh, come now, Alex, Lord Tyrrell said. It was a delightful country scene. I can't remember seeing a more attractive cow. It was a portrait of my governess, Alex replied, deadpan, and you advise that I burn it, immediately. Rosalind, unable to contain herself, burst into laughter. The Duke turned to look at her with surprise, but seeing her delight, found himself chuckling as well. It wasn't that amusing, he protested, attempting a serious expression but failing miserably. Oh, I can just see you now, you poor thing, Rosalind said, still laughing. I imagine you were such a serious little artist. I was. It was devastating. Do I not look devastated? Alex asked, which made Rosalind laugh harder. With great affectation, he heaved a dramatic sigh. You had better be grateful you're so lovely when you're amused, he muttered, full of mock indignation. Oh, please, Rosalind said, tapping him playfully on the arm. Rosalind caught Isabella's eye then, and there was a strange expression on the younger sister's face, like she was trying to understand something. It was almost as if she recognised something she had glimpsed once before and was trying to recall it. Immediately, Rosalind sobered and remembered why it was that she was really there. 
Actually, Lord Tyrrell, if it's new talent that you're seeking, you might have a look at some of my sister's work, Rosalind said, nodding toward Isabella. She has a rare gift. I, oh no, I don't think, Isabella began. It's true, the Duke confirmed. I might not be able to wield a brush, but I recognise masterpieces when I see them. That's kind of you, but I really am not, Isabella protested again. This time, it was Miss Sharples who put a hand on her arm, interrupting her. Listen to me, my dear, she said, looking Isabella directly in the eye. This is a hard world for lady artists. You will never claw out a handhold for yourself if you do not seize the opportunity. Now, is this what you wish? Do you want to keep your light hidden under a basket for the world to never see your work? Chapter 11 Rosalind watched Isabella closely. She could almost see the thoughts as they grappled around in Isabella's head. To her immense pleasure and pride, Isabella spoke up, her voice clear, and her eyes raised directly to Lord Tyrrell. I should be very glad if you might consent to viewing some of my work, she said. I believe it has merit, but would value your opinion. As you come with the highest recommendations, I should be pleased to do so. Very pleased, Lord Tyrrell said with a happy nod. Might I call upon you this afternoon? Today? Isabella asked, her eyes going wide with alarm. I, that's so soon, I haven't prepared anything. Good, Lord Tyrrell said. I would like to see your work as it is, as naturally as possible. Until this afternoon, then, Rosalind said, which settled the matter. As they were leaving Lord Tyrrell's house, Isabella seized both Rosalind and the Duke by the hands. Please tell me that you will both be there with me, she said, her eyes pleading. I don't know if I can face this alone. Of course, Rosalind said, putting her arm about Isabella's shoulders. As it happened, all of Isabella's fretting was for naught. Lord Tyrrell was immediately taken with Isabella's paintings, asking intently about her process. It wasn't long before they were lost in a world of their own with Amelia trailing along behind to act as a chaperone. Seeking a moment of quiet amidst the bustling activity of the house, Rosalind slipped into the library. She took a deep breath, glad of the familiar smells of the books and the relative quiet. The door cracked open again, and the Duke slipped in with the manner of someone attempting to sneak away. His eyes lighted on Rosalind, and a guilty smile flickered across his handsome face. I see that we were of a similar mind, he said. I know that we were meant to be supportive, but those two are so alike that I couldn't get a word in if I tried. I'm pleased, Rosalind said. What were they discussing when you left? He was asking Isabella about her paint recipes, something about linseed oil. I didn't follow a word of it, Alex admitted. He cast an appreciative glance about the library, turning around to look at all of the shelves. This is a magnificent library, he said with frank admiration. I think it might be bigger than the one on my estate. Feel free to browse, Your Grace, Rosalind said. As they browsed the shelves, their hands reached for the same book, brushing against each other in a fleeting touch that sent a shiver down Rosalind's spine. She glanced up at Alex, her breath catching in her throat as she met his gaze a silent acknowledgement of the growing connection between them. Lost in conversation, they settled into the comfortable chairs of the library, the world beyond the walls fading away as they discussed their hopes, dreams and the challenges they faced in navigating the expectations of their world. Rosalind found herself opening up to Alex in a way she had never done before, sharing her deepest desires and fears, her voice filled with a vulnerability that surprised even herself. They leaned closer toward each other as they spoke, gesturing emphatically as they spoke with feeling and enthusiasm. The moment was shattered when the library door burst open, making both of them leap apart. Rosalind! Isabella cried, Amelia trailing in her wake. You will never, ever believe it, she said, flying straight for her sister. Rosalind stood, catching her by the arms. What? What is it? Has something happened? It most certainly has, Isabella said, her voice trembling. Lord Tyrrell, 
He wants to exhibit some of my work. He thinks it would perfectly complement the paintings on display. He's gone now to arrange it, but he'll be back later to speak to Father. I can't believe it, can you? Isabella said in a breathless rush. Of course I can, Rosalind said, breaking into a smile. I never had a doubt that he would love your work. Oh, Rosalind, she said, throwing her arms about her neck. I cannot thank you enough. And you too, Your Grace, she said, beaming at him as well. Oh, my heavens, which pieces will I select? I can't possibly choose, oh gracious me. Peace, Isabella, Amelia said, taking Isabella gently by the arm. Let's go see what we can sort out. I will help you, she said. She paused by the library door, casting a strange look at Rosalind and the Duke, who, though standing a respectable distance apart, seemed connected by a kind of palpable energy. I sincerely hope that you know how much this means to me, and to Isabella too. Rosalind said tenderly. She gazed up at the Duke with perfect sincerity. I must confess that I had never suspected you would do something like this for my sister. Or for me. Alex turned to Rosalind, his eyes filled with a warmth that took her breath away. You have done an incredible thing here, Rosalind, he murmured, his voice low and sincere. Your dedication to your sister's happiness is truly inspiring. Rosalind felt a blush rise to her cheeks at his words, a sense of pride and accomplishment swelling within her chest. As they stood side by side, their hands brushing against each other in a moment of shared triumph. Rosalind realised that her feelings for Alex had grown far beyond the practical arrangement they had initially agreed upon. Rosalind stood beside Alex, her heart swelling with pride as she surveyed the exhibition room, alive with the buzz of admiration for Isabella's stunning artwork. The cream of London's high society mingled amidst the glittering chandeliers, their voices a symphony of praise and appreciation. Rosalind's gaze drifted to her sister, who blushed under the attentions of Lord Tyrrell. Your work is truly exceptional, Lady Isabella, Lord Tyrrell declared, his eyes alight with genuine admiration. The emotion, the depth, the raw talent, it's breathtaking. You've taken the mundane and treated it with such dignity and grace that it's become elevated. Isabella ducked her head, a shy smile playing at the corners of her lips. You're too kind, Lord Tyrrell. I'm merely expressing the beauty I see in the world around me. What a precious thing to see the world with such eyes, Lord Tyrrell replied, his voice and expression soft. Rosalind watched the exchange with a mixture of joy and protectiveness, her heart aching for her sister's happiness. She leaned closer to Alex, her voice low and conspiratorial. I think Lord Tyrrell is quite taken with our dear Isabella. Alex chuckled softly, dipping his head to speak closely into her ear in a way that made Rosalind shiver. It seems her talent has the power to captivate even the most discerning of critics. As they moved through the crowd, Rosalind couldn't help but notice the curious glances and murmured speculations that followed in their wake. The sight of the Duke of Somerton and the unconventional Lady Rosalind together as a couple had set tongues wagging. The air was thick with the weight of gossip and conjecture. Rosalind lifted her chin, determined to ignore the whispers and focus on the triumph of the moment. She and Alex paused before one of Isabella's most striking pieces, a hauntingly beautiful portrait that seemed to capture the very essence of the subject's soul. She has a rare gift, Alex murmured, his eyes fixed on the painting, the ability to see beneath the surface, to reveal the truth of a person's character. Rosalind nodded, her heart swelling with love and admiration for her sister. Isabella has always had a way of understanding people, of seeing the beauty and pain that others often overlook. But even as they lost themselves in the magic of the artwork, the tranquility of the moment was shattered by the insidious whispers that began to circulate through the room. Members of the Ton, their faces alight with a malicious glee, huddled together in small groups, their voices low and conspiratorial as they shared the latest gossip. Rosalind strained to catch the threads of conversation, 
her heart sinking as she heard Alex's name repeated in hushed tones, accompanied by words like indiscretions and scandal. She glanced at Alex, saw the tightening of his jaw and the flash of anger in his eyes, and knew that the rumours had reached his ears as well. Strangely, a stab of anger, a sort of protectiveness that she had hitherto only felt for her sisters, lanced through Rosalind. She could feel her temper rising, and she turned scathing eyes on those who gossiped. Alex, catching the way that she whipped her head around to glare at someone who said his name, touched her arm gently. Are you all right? he asked. They have no right, she hissed, not bothering to hide her irritation. Who do they think they are? Though clearly still annoyed, Alex exhaled a laugh. Rosalind glanced up at him and was somewhat mollified to find that he was not as upset as he had been. Your loyalty is surprisingly touching. His expression faded, a frown replacing it. Would you excuse me? I must attend to something. And with that, he departed without waiting for a reply, his eyes fixed on something across the room. Rosalind, feeling strangely alone, was left like a stone in the middle of a river as the gossip continued to swirl about her. Chapter 12 Rosalind stood amidst the crowded exhibition hall, her senses assaulted by the hushed whispers and furtive glances of the gossiping ton. The once joyous atmosphere, filled with admiration for Isabella's stunning artwork, had taken on a sinister edge, the air heavy with the weight of scandal and rumour. She strained to catch snippets of their poisonous words, her heart sinking with each passing moment. Whispers of Alex's alleged indiscretions and secret rendezvous swirled through the room like a noxious fog, threatening to suffocate the very joy and accomplishment of the evening. I heard he's been carrying on with a married woman, one lady murmured behind her fan, her eyes glinting with a malicious delight. The poor duke, caught in such a sordid affair. And to think, he's here with that Harrington girl, another responded, her voice dripping with disdain. I wonder if she knows the truth about the man she's been trying to net. Rosalind's cheeks burned with indignation, her hands clenched into fists at her sides. How dare they spread such vicious lies about Alex, a man of honour and integrity. She whipped her head around to glare at the gossiping duo, her eyes burning. They were a matched pair, both of them powdered and rouged in the manner of the last century. One lifted a lorgnette to inspect Rosalind, and upon realising that Rosalind was staring right back at her, sniffed and turned her face away, her nose in the air. It's petty gossip, the same as every season, fuelled by the jealousy and resentment of those who seek to tear others down to puff themselves up. Rosalind consoled herself. She had never been one to be cowed by society matrons, and she refused to give them the satisfaction now of thinking that they had succeeded in getting under her skin. Undaunted, she tossed her head proudly and sauntered to the table with punch and lemonade arranged in cut crystal cups, as if there was nothing else on her mind but simple refreshment. Yet, even as she silently fumed, Rosalind could feel the weight of their stares upon her the smug expressions and knowing looks that followed her every move. She felt like all were staring at her, her every action and reaction scrutinised and judged by the merciless eyes of the ton. She felt a rising tide of panic within her, a desperate need to escape the suffocating atmosphere of the exhibition hall. Her gaze sought out Alex, longing for the comfort and reassurance of his presence, but he was nowhere to be found lost amidst the throng of gossiping aristocrats. She knew that she could not stand idly by and allow the poison of the ton to destroy their budding relationship, to tarnish the reputation of a man who had shown her nothing but kindness and respect. With a deep breath, Rosalind squared her shoulders, her chin lifting in a show of defiance. Glancing across the room, she saw Isabella basking in the praise of her artwork a radiant smile lighting up her features. Lord Tyrrell stood by her side, his eyes alight with admiration as he spoke animatedly about her paintings. Isabella's cheeks flushed with a mixture of pride and bashfulness, her eyes sparkling as she listened intently to his words. Lord Harrington, 
who had viewed the whole enterprise with suspicion at best, stood just behind her, basking in the praise as if he himself had been the one to paint the pictures. Nearby, Amelia was engaged in a hushed conversation with a young woman who discreetly passed her a folded note, undoubtedly from Thomas. Rosalind watched as Amelia's hand trembled slightly as she accepted the letter, her eyes darting around the room to ensure that no one had noticed the exchange. A flicker of hope and longing danced across Amelia's face as she tucked the note into her beaded reticule, a secret treasure to be savoured in a moment of solitude. The sight of her sister's happiness momentarily eased Rosalind's troubled mind, reminding her of the sacrifices she was willing to make to protect them. She knew that her decision to accept Alex's courtship had not been made lightly, and that she had weighed the consequences and the potential impact on her own heart and future. But as she watched Isabella and Amelia, their faces alight with joy and the prospect of love, Rosalind knew that she would endure a thousand scandals and face a million whispers to ensure their happiness. They were her sisters, her blood, the very beat of her heart, and she would move heaven and earth to shield them from the cruelties of the world. Rosalind's resolve strengthened as she stood amidst the gossiping throng, her head held high and her spirit unbroken. She would not let the vicious rumours and malicious whispers of the ton tear apart the fragile threads of happiness that she and her sisters had fought so hard to weave. Rosalind had ever been a woman of action, not one to simply stand by and let things happen to her. To be so trapped by the wagging tongues about her now was abhorrent to her, but she had no idea how to proceed. For all of her knowledge, she was ill-practised at manipulating the ton to her whims. I heard he's been seen in the company of a notorious courtesan, one woman murmured, her eyes glinting with a wicked delight. Apparently she's been his mistress for months, right under the nose of polite society. Well, it's hardly surprising, is it? We all know what the brother's like after all, another replied, her voice dripping with disdain. Poor thing, she has no idea what she's getting herself into. That's not even the worst of it, the first said, her face flushed with malicious glee. I've heard that she's French, she said with relish. Oh, how unseemly, the second tutted. She put a handkerchief to her nose as if the very idea had produced a noxious odour. It's one thing to be a rake, but an unpatriotic rake that takes the biscuit. Unable to help herself, Rosalind sidled up closer to them. That's not even the worst of it, she said, staring directly into their faces. I've heard that he's hiding a pair of horns beneath that rather fabulous head of hair, she said. The doctor said they were brought on by indulging in too much gossip. She punctuated this with a sickeningly sugary smile, staring at each of the ladies in turn until they excused themselves, faces red. Harpies, Rosalind muttered. She knew realistically that she could not address each and every gossip, but it was a tempting prospect. In the hopes of avoiding further upset, she retreated further into the house, near the sitting room that had been designated as the gentleman's smoking retreat. Not even here was safe, however, for Rosalind overheard a group of gentlemen, their voices low and conspiratorial. They say he's been gambling away his fortune at the gaming hells, one man whispered his brow furrowed with disapproval. Apparently he's in debt up to his ears and is only courting the Harrington girl for her dowry. I wouldn't be surprised if he's planning to abandon her at the altar, another chimed in, his tone laced with a cruel amusement. After all, what use does a man like him have for a wife when he has his pick of London's most beautiful mistresses? Mark my words, she'll be packed off to the countryside and never seen or heard from again. Rosalind's heart clenched at the words, a sickening feeling settling in the pit of her stomach. She didn't want to believe the lies they were spreading, the vicious rumours that painted Alex as a man without honour or integrity. Yet Rosalind couldn't help but wonder if there was any truth to these rumours. It wasn't as if the notion of a husband stealing his wife's fortune and leaving her in some reclusive house was unheard of after all. Countless stories abounded of men shipping their wives off to convents or asylums once their usefulness had come to an end. 
Though the rooms were large and spacious, Rosalind felt the walls closing in, the air growing stifling as the rumours swirled around her, threatening to consume her. The once grand and elegant exhibition hall now felt like a cage, trapping her within its confines and subjecting her to the merciless scrutiny of the ton. Rosalind's feet carried her swiftly through the exhibition hall, her silk gown rustling as she wove her way through the crowd. She kept her gaze fixed ahead, refusing to meet the eyes of those who sought to draw her into their web of scandal and deceit. With each step, the need for escape grew stronger, the desire to break free from the confines of the hall and the suffocating weight of the rumours. The room was too warm, too loud, and Rosalind's heart beat wildly in her chest. By the time she reached the front doors thrown open wide to welcome in the guests, she was nearly running. She could feel the eyes of the ton upon her, their gazes heavy with anticipation and cruel delight, eager to witness her downfall. Some part of her knew that she was giving them exactly what they wanted, creating a scene that would be taken as confirmation of the rumours. Rosalind refused to give them the satisfaction of seeing her crumble. With a deep breath and a silent prayer for strength, she slipped out into the cooler London night air. Carriages continued to pull up and disgorge guests, fur and diamonds on parade. Her stomach flipped at the idea of further socialising. So silent as a shadow, Rosalind clung to the shadows and made her way to the back of the house. Thankfully, the gate to the garden was unlocked and untended, and Rosalind stepped through with only a slight groan of the iron hinges to give her away. The cool night air washed over her like a soothing balm. She took a deep, steadying breath, her hands trembling as she grappled with the conflicting emotions that threatened to overwhelm her. The weight of the whispers and stares from the ton still clung to her like a heavy shroud, the echoes of their malicious gossip ringing in her ears. She walked deeper into the gardens, seeking solace in the darkness and solitude. The further she ventured, the more the lights and sounds of the exhibition faded away, replaced by the gentle rustling of leaves and the soft chirping of crickets. Rosalind welcomed the embrace of the shadows, finding comfort in the anonymity they provided. Unusually, Lord Tyrrell's grand house boasted quite a sizeable garden, a rare luxury in London. It was like an oasis of peace and quiet. Unsurprisingly, however, it was packed with statues and fountains, all of them lovely to behold. The marble gleamed brightly in the moonlight, and even in her unsettled state, Rosalind had to admire them. As she wandered along the winding paths, her mind raced with thoughts of Alex and the rumours that seemed to follow in his wake. She wanted to believe that all of them were lies. The seeds of doubt had been planted, though. Now she couldn't shake the nagging feeling of uncertainty that gnawed at her heart. Rosalind found herself in a secluded corner of the gardens, far from the prying eyes and wagging tongues of the ton. She leaned against a stone bench, her fingers gripping the cool surface through her thin silk gloves as she tried to steady her breathing and calm her racing thoughts. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps approaching from behind shattered the tranquility of the moment. Rosalind's heart leapt into her throat, her body tensing as she whirled around to face the intruder. In the darkness, she could barely make out the silhouette of a figure drawing nearer, their features obscured by the shadows. Chapter 13 Alex's heart clenched as he watched Rosalind flee the exhibition, her face a mask of distress and confusion. It wasn't difficult to imagine what had upset her. Alex couldn't help but mentally flog himself for not trusting her enough to warn her in advance. She had done nothing to make him believe that she would not continue to exercise the same fierce loyalty she had demonstrated, and now they were both paying the price. Excusing himself from a conversation with a group of noblemen, Alex followed Rosalind's path out of the room, his steps quick and determined. He watched with some alarm as she stepped out into the night alone with neither escort nor shawl. He lost her for a moment in the gardens, his apprehension growing, worried that he had lost her. He rounded a bend, and there she was, beneath the gentle sway of a willow tree, gripping the back of a stone bench as if it were the only thing anchoring her to shore. The moonlight cast a soft glow upon her features, illuminating the tears that glistened on her cheeks, 
but her jaw was determinedly set. She looked up sharply at the sound of his boots on the paving stones, her eyes probing the darkness. Rosalind, he called out softly, his voice tinged with concern. It's only me. She visibly relaxed, her shoulders sagging as she recognised his familiar form. Alex closed the distance between them, his gaze locked on her tear-stained face. She returned his gaze for a moment, a surprisingly vulnerable softness on her face. Her expression changed suddenly, and she reached up and swiped angrily at her eyes with her palm. I detest crying, she muttered, especially in front of people. I beg your pardon, but surely I am not people, he said, attempting levity. She responded with a watery, strangled laugh that tugged at his heart. Rosalind, he said, softening. Please talk to me. Let me help you. I'm sorry, Rosalind whispered, her voice trembling. I know that this is Isabella's night, but I couldn't bear to stay in there any longer with all of them. She gestured contemptuously back in the direction of the house. The way they talk. It was just, it was too much. Alex remained silent, unsure of how to comfort her. This was an unforeseen consequence of his plan. He'd only wanted to clear his own name, to turn the ton's attention to something else. It had never occurred to him that he might drag Rosalind down with him. Rosalind turned to face him, her eyes searching his for the truth she so clearly needed. Alex, I... I don't know what to believe anymore. The rumours, the whispers. It's a lot to bear. This isn't what I had imagined when I... She trailed off, looking down and then away, her hands holding tightly to the bench again as if she wanted a shield between them. When you made your bold proposal, he finished for her. With her face still turned away, she nodded. Slowly giving her every opportunity to move away, Alex carefully stepped closer. He took one of her gloved hands in his, lifting it from the bench. Alex's heart constricted as he watched Rosalind's face as she clearly waged some sort of internal debate. Her eyes, once filled with warmth and affection, were now muddied with doubt and suspicion. Rosalind stared straight into his eyes, silently demanding answers he couldn't fully provide. Rosalind, please, Alex implored his voice strained with desperation. You must believe me when I say that these rumours are baseless. I would never betray your trust or our understanding. Rosalind's lips trembled, her words laced with a bitter edge. How can I believe you, Alex, when the evidence seems to mount against you? The whispers, the knowing glances. They all point to a truth I cannot ignore. Wordlessly, her hand slipped from his, the silk whispering between his fingers. He could feel her emotionally pulling away as well, and for the first time he had a real sense of what that meant. There was little doubt in his mind that once her affections were decided, Rosalind was the sort of woman who would love fully and without reservation. He had already glimpsed her fierce loyalty, and it was clear that if her trust were to ever be betrayed, it would be nigh impossible to regain. Alex stepped forward, his hand reaching out to bridge the growing chasm between them, his fingers curling around her wrist. I am a man of honour, Rosalind. My word is my bond. If I could explain the nature of these meetings, I would. But I am bound by a duty that goes beyond myself. Rosalind flinched away from his touch, wrapping her arms tightly around herself as if to shield her heart from further pain. Duty? She scoffed, her voice raw with emotion. Is that what you call sneaking around while all of London watches attending clandestine meetings with unknown women? The accusation stung, piercing Alex's heart like a dagger. He closed his eyes for a moment, gathering his thoughts and tempering his own rising frustration. Rosalind, I have never been anything but truthful with you. These meetings, while secretive, are not what you think. They are matters of family honour, of protecting those I hold dear. Rosalind's eyes glistened with unshed tears, her voice trembling as she spoke. Family honour? What of the honour of the woman you've pledged yourself to? 
What of the trust we've built, the understanding we've forged? What of my reputation? Have you any idea of the damage you are doing to me, to my own prospects? Alex's heart ached at the pain in her words, the realisation that his actions, though well-intentioned, had inadvertently wounded the woman he had grown to care for so deeply. Rosalind, I... he began, his voice faltering as he searched for the right words to attempt to smooth over the cracks that were appearing between them. But Rosalind held up a hand, silencing him. No, Alex, I cannot bear any more excuses or half-truths. If we are to proceed with this, this attachment, then you must be honest with me, fully and completely. Surely I deserve nothing less. Alex hesitated, caught between his own desires and his duty, balanced on a knife point. He knew that he could not reveal the full extent of his investigations, the delicate balance of power and politics that hung in the balance. He also knew that he could not bear to lose Rosalind to see the light in her eyes extinguished by doubt and mistrust. Rosalind, he said softly, his voice filled with a quiet intensity. I am bound by oaths and obligations that I cannot break, but I swear to you, on my honour as a gentleman, that I have never betrayed your trust. These meetings, though shrouded in secrecy, are not what the rumours suggest. Rosalind's gaze searched his her eyes filled with a desperate need for reassurance, for a glimmer of the trust that had once flowed so easily between them. Then tell me, Alex, give me something to hold on to, a reason to believe in you despite the whispers and the doubts. The weight of his responsibilities warred with the yearning in his heart. He knew that he could not reveal the full truth, but he also knew that he could not let Rosalind slip away lost to the shadows of misunderstanding and mistrust. The meetings, he began, his voice low and earnest, are related to a matter of great importance to my family, a matter that, if brought to light, could have grave consequences for those I hold dear. I cannot divulge more, but I ask you to trust in the man you've come to know. As one who takes the well-being and happiness of your sister so seriously, I am sure that you can understand the importance of loyalty to family. Rosalind's expression softened, a flicker of understanding dawning in her eyes. Alex, I... she whispered, her voice trailing off as she grappled with the conflicting emotions that swirled within her. Alex closed the distance between them, his hands gently cradling her face as he looked deep into her eyes, greatly daring. Rosalind leaned into his touch her eyes fluttering closed as a single tear escaped down her cheek. I want to trust you, Alex, I truly do. But the doubts, the fears, this is uncharted territory for me, and I don't know where to turn for safe harbour. The depth of her vulnerability touched Alex in a way that he had never experienced before. Though still clouded by suspicion, he had glimpsed Rosalind's heart, and it was a beautiful golden thing. She had not pulled away from him, and the feeling of her porcelain face in his hands was worth all of the hardship they had endured through the evening. Suddenly the sound of the garden gate clanging open echoed across the garden. He heard approaching voices, the distant chatter growing louder with each passing second. He knew that they couldn't be found like this, alone and unchaperoned in a dark garden at night. The scandal that would ensue the damage to Rosalind's reputation was a risk he couldn't bear to take. With a heavy heart, Alex pulled away from Rosalind, his hands dropping from her face as he took a step back. Rosalind glanced behind him, a flicker of understanding mingled with frustration in her eyes. She smoothed her gown and patted her hair, composing herself as best she could, even as the turmoil of their unfinished conversation lingered in the air between them. There's a door on the west side of the house, Alex whispered urgently. You can slip inside that way and no one will see you. I'll stay here and ensure you aren't discovered. We will continue this discussion later, she said tenderly, a slight crack in her voice the only sign of the turmoil within her. I need answers, Alex. I need to know that I can trust you fully and completely. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. 
What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.